Café Day René with René Dupree. Bonjour, Bonjour tout le monde. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue au carnival. Carnival. How you say? I'm doing good, man. Still in a heat wave here. Doing good. Was <laughs> looking good, looking real good. <laughs> <laughs> I've pissed myself off. I've watched that clip 10 times at least. Yeah. Well, speaker looking good. We've got a great, uh, uh, well, Paul's running late, everyone. As normal, he will be joining us soon. But, uh, Renee, shall we bring in our first guest of the evening? Yes, the moment that everybody's been waiting for. Uh, this week's mystery guest. I know him as the thrill seeker. Everyone else knows him as Spirit Squad Johnny, the one, the only Johnny Jeter. Jesus Christ. <laughs> What's going on, fellas? <laughs> What's going on, Jethro? Not much, man. Just uh, living the dream. What about you? You look like you're living your best out there. Fucking A. <laughs> it's like a Jack from... Bond villain. I know. Fuck you you kind of do. I, it's the glasses, I think. Well, or the skin tone. I can't tell or combination of both. But either way, yeah, you <laughs> you look like you're living your best. I'm, uh, yeah, man, I'm having a good time, man. You know, just uh, how's Cali? Cali's good, man. Can't, it's a little it's a little warm today, but uh, you know, it's in the 90s. But uh, yeah, man, like it's it's going good. Can't complain. You know, I get to work from home and and uh, yeah, just hang out with my dog, get some work done. I'm working right now, <laughs> right? So. Uh, yeah, James, what's going on with you, man? You look like you're living in a dark cave with a light shining in your face. I'm in a, ge I'm in a gazebo outside. <laughs> Wait, you're so, outside? Yeah, uh, I put up. Uh, I had a long story over the weekend. Um, everyone knows it now. But um, yesterday, I went shopping for a gazebo, so we put it outside. So my kids decided to uh, put the TV in the gazebo, the PlayStation everything's in this gazebo so it's like a it's like an outdoors man cave it looks good i can't see it but i'm sure it looks good <laughs> oh it's nice, nice and cold today to like today it's like super hot with like 36 degrees fahrenheit or whatever it was uh celsius one or two celsius so um it was a spot because of british weather the humidity just makes us sweat like pigs so all i've been doing is just been drinking all day drunk <laughs> Well, when I say drinking, I'm talking like water. <laughs> and uh, well, you are British, right? So that can be confusing, right? <laughs> yeah. I will do one of these episodes drunk one day. Actually, you know what? I'm making a, a statement right here. Uh, okay. Hold, once hold we reach phone. twenty-five thousand subscribers, I will do a live, a live broadcast, and uh, I'm gonna drink Jack Daniels. I'll drink a whole forty. <laughs> Hold the phone, guys. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Subscribers through the roof. <laughs> no, I swear to God, once you reach 25,000, uh, it's going to be drinks with Dupree all night long. I'm going to finish a 40 of Jack. What are you at now? Th like 10,000, right? 10,000. Uh, 10,100, I think. All right. When you reach yeah. ten thousand one hundred and one, you know I'll have some Jack Daniels too. <laughs> I think we might be more. I think we're at ten thousand one hundred fifteen. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Once we reach twenty five k, it'll be no longer Cafe de Renee. It's gonna be drinks with Dupree on Thursday nights. Drinks. Well, I mean, there's a cafe. Dupree. Hypothetically speaking, you should be drinking. It's not a. It's not bar or, or happy hour with Dupree. It's a cafe, so you know it's kind of kind of deceiving. You should have like a coffee or tea or something. A little. The fuck you think this okay, is? No, we don't know what that is, Renee. <laughs> that could be anything. Crazy. <laughs> that could that could be like some hallucinogens mixed with. Give you a fucking big glass of GHB. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh. The cafe. All right, Max. <laughs> Thanks for the donation. Oh, thank you, Mark. <laughs> Appreciate that. Hey Jeter, are you allowed to like discuss your um your um your um experimental days, your experimental days with like substances oh, with your job? Mm, Probably not, right? I, I don't I don't think I should only because there's ten thousand subscribers and and right. who knows. I feel like there's some rando dude in like either Nigeria or Switzerland who's updating my Wikipedia page with everything. Like as soon as I got married. 
like the day or two after it was like married to let's see Rochelle Jeter. I was like, holy shit, who's updating that? And then some of that stuff isn't accurate. So I went in. I mean, who better sort as the as the source than the guy himself? I started updating stuff and uh, yeah, it got taken off. And whoever whoever the guy was who I can't even understand the language that he speaks. Um, he deleted my stuff and left a comment and I was too lazy to put it in Google Translate. But either way, I was like, wait, uh, whatever. I'm too lazy to, I'm to, to even go back and change it all. But uh, so my point being, if I talk about that, next thing I know, it's on my Wikipedia page. And God forbid, if I ever lose my job or go somewhere else and they pull that stuff up. And I mean, the last thing I need them is, is, you know, well, hearing stories about, about my, uh, my days of yore. <laughs> I don't know. Speaking of Wikipedia, about eight, nine years ago, I actually went and checked it out. And apparently I died of a heroin overdose in 1997 when I was 12. Maybe you did it. You don't remember. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> they brought you back. They brought me back, dude. Yeah. <laughs> was it called? Was it, cold? Was it a rep repressed memory? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm You're back like, from the I dead. About it, I think I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got a question for you Johnny uh, thank you Josh Coffey uh, big fan of the 06 Spirit Squad one of the best heel groups in WWE can Jita talk about Elijah Burke turning down the Spirit Squad he said hell to the no low I don't know if he said hell to the no but I just know and, and hey I have the utmost respect for Pope uh, I don't refer to him as anything else Pope <laughs> <laughs> Pope. Pope. Pope's cool. Uh, no, hey, he just recognized that that wasn't for him, and that's okay, and which is scary and developmental because you don't know if you're going to get fired tomorrow, and then let's say you go home and you see the Spirit Squad wrestling DX, and you're like, crap, I could be wrestling Shawn Michaels, Triple H, Ric Flair, those guys, and I'm stuck at home, fired with no job, you know, applying for a job at Dairy Queen. Like, you know, or maybe something better will come come along. And I think when we were in developmental, you you never knew. You had this mentality of like, hey, if you get the call up, you know, do whatever they tell you to do. And then after that gimmick runs its course, you then you can do whatever you want to do. You know, you can be anything. It's just getting up there is the tough part. So I think he took a big gamble turning down the spirit squad. But ultimately, like, I mean, look at him. He 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 kept, stayed true to himself and uh, he's had a long, illustrious career. And uh <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Love Pope. Love Pope. I, I'm thinking of like when when we were. I was. I went to go see Matt Capitelli before he passed away, and Nova and I did, and um, Elijah was there. And yeah, <laughs> sorry, I called him Elijah. Pope was there, and uh, it. He's just. <laughs> it's kind of a somber, you know, tone in the room because I mean Cap. You know, he he. You know, he had like a, a brain tumor. You know, stage four, and it was pretty heavy. But you know having Pope there was just hilarious, you know, and, you know, I, I mean, Hey, he, I, I don't think he'd probably tell the story, but it was kind of funny because he starts talking about his boxing ring and how he's in the hall of fame. Like of all the things to talk about, I mean, dude, he went on and on and on. Like if there's a Guinness book of world record of who can talk about themselves for the longest amount of time in front of us, someone who's dying, it's <laughs> Elijah Burke. <laughs> And uh, he started going on and on about his uh, his his boxing hall of fame. And hey, man, he made it in the boxing hall of fame. That's pretty badass. And he has a ring. And then so he starts talking about that. And like Cap's wife's there, and like his family's there. And then he starts telling another story. And then at some point he goes, "Wait, hold on a second. He goes, "Lindsay, you think Matt wants to hold my ring?" <laughs> Knowing Cap, probably not. But he couldn't really vocalize it, so he's just sitting there. And Nova and I just look at each other like. <laughs> and then so I think and so Elijah takes off his ring hands it to Lindsay and Lindsay walks over there like okay it puts it in Cap's hand and Cap's just sitting there and imagine like if you couldn't move or speak and Elijah's making you hold his Hall of Fame ring you you know I'd I'd probably be like uh, 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 to try to like <laughs> no, let go of that thing but, and I love Elijah hey come on it's all I'm just poking fun but <laughs> it's pretty funny <laughs> We got uh, another question. Uh, yeah, everyone in the chats, by the way, is saying to Gia, looking good, Gia, looking real good. Renee, <laughs> Wait, Renee, is that sarcastic or are they, are they no, being serious? Oh, <laughs> Renee, give Gia the context because of that. Oh, Jesus. Listen to this, John. So, all right. We had Paul London on last week, right? And yep. he was telling a story about him and Brian finished a match and they were showering. And they were showering, then they could feel someone staring at them. 
So as they slowly turned, Michael Hayes dang, dang, was leaning against a pillar, staring at him, right? Like rubbing his hairy chest. <laughs> then he says, looking good, boys. Oh, looking Christ. Really good. And then he just walks Thank off. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate it, sir. <laughs> you my mind, sir. <laughs> Any feedback from tonight? <laughs> really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's uh, uh, that's uh, fancy Lance. That's a great name. That's a great gimmick, fancy Lance. Um, thank you, Super Chat. Uh, what is missing in wrestling? Fat makes you feel disconnected from modern day wrestling. If is there any fixing it at this point? Uh, there's always fixing it. I mean, wrestling is just, I mean, it's, it'll go on forever. I hope. Um, but no, in my opinion, uh, first, wait, that was a question directed at me. Special guest, you take it first, pal. Special, special guest. Um, no, I think storytelling is missing from wrestling. I think, uh, you know, I, I stepped away from it. I came back, I started watching it. It just seems very, you know, and, and before I get into the negatives, you know, I just say it's, you know, everyone's athletes, they're, they're going out, they're busting their ass and like, they're doing stuff I couldn't even dream of doing. However, um, I think there's just not a lot of storytelling that I'm seeing that, you know, less is more tell a story. You know, if you're going out there just doing shine, heat, come back, finish, you don't really, you don't get it. You know, you'll, you got to tell a story where it's big man, little man, or, Hey, he's working his arm or he keeps going after his arm. He can't get it. And then finally he does. I mean, he one ups the hill. You know what I mean? And then, I think it's just whatever story you're telling that's uh, trying to get him off his feet, whatever it is that that aspect of it is because they're not cheering the wrestler. They're cheering the move and it's the move that's getting over, not the wrestler. And then as soon as you realize you're going to wake up one day, like I can't do those, those 540 superstar backhanded splashes off the springboard splashes off the top rope anymore because my body can't take it. You're going to dial it down, which is what you should have done 10 years ago. And then you're going to, people are going to boo you because they feel like you're you're not giving it your all. So I think careers are kind of shortened by the crazy moves that everyone's doing when they could be doing a lot less, getting a lot more out of it, and telling stories that people can relate to and connect to emotionally. Very well said, Jeter. Wow, Thanks, brother. You articulated so well. Thanks, man. With that being said, <laughs> you didn't do your homework, asshole. You were supposed to watch AEW. You didn't do it, did you? No, I no. I mean, hey, I, I I wanted to. I thought about doing it. Crossed my mind at least four to five times, but <laughs> I didn't do it. And I wanted to, <laughs> but you know, no. I, I honestly, I, I don't. I don't. I think I just I, I missed it. I apologize about that. So I'm assuming you guys are going to talk about it. I'll just uh, um actually stay quiet doing it. The, the goddamn this thing happened. We had a power outage here from 8 30 to 11 30 so i missed the show but i did watch the the speedy version there's like a condensed version like a 36 minute version wow and i watched about five minutes of that and uh yeah hell, hell i'm trying to, trying, I'm trying hell to read your face i can't tell if you liked it or disliked it <laughs> <laughs> no man it's like a lot of those guys do a lot of cool stuff when they can hit it, but there was so many botches in the five minutes that I watched, I couldn't watch anymore. It's like they tried to do too much shit, and wow, yeah, yeah. and like the fundamentals, man. Like a lot of these guys, they don't know how to chain wrestle. Remember when we were in OBW and Rip and niggas do an hour chain drills? Yeah, I do. I actually did that with my uh, my uh, students the other day, and uh, I was going back work at wrestle a leg, and now get heat on a leg, you know, wrestle an arm, now get heat on an arm, you know, kick it in, god damn it. <laughs> with that being said, let's promote your school right now. Tell us, tell us about it. You got a wrestling school out there in California? Yeah, Cameron Park, California, Manicore Wrestling Academy. It's been open uh, since January of this past year. Um, I got about four four students. A lot of guys coming in and out. I'll talk about that in a second. But I got four solid students right now. Um, we're running a show October 22nd at the uh, uh, Movement Brewing Company in Rancho Cordova. Um, yeah, Saturday, October 22nd. So uh, it's our first show. I think one, possibly two of my students will wrestle on the show. The other ones are just indie guys. But uh, we're just trying to kind of promote Manicor Wrestling Academy and get, get indie wrestling out in some of these breweries because they're, they're popping right now. 
So uh, I think eventually, you know, kind of like what Danny did, you know, I'll probably have some amateur shows, maybe at like a National Guard Armory or, you know, our Veterans Hall or something like that. But uh, this one, you know, they're, they're, they're we're expecting a lot of people. It should be a good time. And uh, it's near Halloween. So, uh, you know, and it's a brewery. How could you not have fun watching wrestling and having some beers? So but yeah, that aside, Manico Wrestling Academy, we train Tuesdays and Thursday nights, six to eight. And uh yeah, all the info you can find is at manacorewrestlingacademy.com, uh, Manicor Wrestling Academy on Instagram, or uh, I'm sure there's something else. Somebody, what a, oh, my Facebook, Manicor Wrestling Academy. Look it up there. There we go. So if you're in the uh, in the Cali area, was it Cameron, California? Cameron Park, California. It's Cameron about 30 Park. minutes east of Sacramento. Just go in for a day, check it out, and... Uh... I highly recommend Jeter because he was trained uh, OVW, man. Some of the best came out of there. We got some more questions there, Jameson. Yeah, let's, let's hit them. Uh, Eamon, thanks uh, for the super chat. Uh, that Michael Hayes story. Hey, hey. <laughs> Wait, we're going to do a full episode of Michael Hayes one day. Definitely. Yes, we are. Um, I've got another one. Uh, Josh Coffey, thanks again. Uh, how much hate did Mitch get for snagging prime Tory Wilson in 07? Must have been tough for him to wrestle with Kidman time in his matches. Yikes. Did he ever Jeez. wrestle Kidman? Jesus. I don't remember Kidman being up there as an agent when I was there. No, they um, released him. He got released by this time. He was released. But no, Mitch was seeing Tori Wilson. And I think she was, you know, and I love Tori, but I think I don't know what was going on with her and Kidman. Maybe they were separated. Maybe they were divorced. I don't know. Um, but I do know that. Uh, um, Dean Malenko was a little upset about it. And I remember we were on a, uh, we were on like a rental car bus going. I don't remember if we were dropping the car off and going back to the airport or if we were vice versa. Um, but he was there and he pretty much told us, and I don't even know how we got on the subject, but he pretty much said, yeah, Hey, after spirit squad runs over, Mitch is gone. And I think we just looked at each other like, Holy shit. Wow. Why? And he's like, well, he broke up my, my friend's marriage. Like, you know, I'll make sure he's gone. So I don't know if if Dean had anything to do with that. He probably did. I mean, who who knows? But I just I know that. I mean, yeah. He I don't think Dean was very happy about that. I don't think Hunter, anyone was. You know, Hunter fucking hated Mitch, like big <laughs> yeah, time. He did. I remember. I remember one time Mitch was standing by the door and like uh, Hunter walked in and like hit him in the hit him. <laughs> And then Hunter just looks at Mitch, a door stop. That's about all you're fucking good for. And just walk away. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, poor Mitch. You know what? Hey, you know, Mitch, you know, obviously during our time back then, I think people made a big deal out of, oh, pay your dues, show some respect. You know, if you were terrified to say I wasn't a wrestling fan growing up, because if you said that, then it's like, what? It was blasphemy. How dare you yeah. want a fan when you were growing up? Now it's probably, I think it's a lot different. But, uh, um, but I mean, imagine you're Mitch, you know, you, you have zero experience. And I don't remember how the situation or the circumstances of how he got signed. But let's say that's you. Same circumstances. You get signed. You get called up in the spirit squad. You have zero experience. You never watch wrestling and you're just thrown up there, you know. I mean, first of all, I don't care who you are, anyone listening, and especially you two guys. Anyone would have said yes to that. Hey, let me be a WB superstar, you know, and all you can do is be humble, shut your mouth, you know, and just uh, take, just get in the ring every day and just try to learn your craft, show some respect for it. Um, I think Mitch did to some extent, but I don't think he realized and maybe it was our age or whatnot, but um, immaturity or whatnot. But I don't think we realized or at least he realized, you know, the opportunity that was given to him because I think had he done that. You know, the last thing you want to do is get heat. You probably wouldn't be making decisions to get heat in whatever regard. And you'd be in the ring every day studying, talking to agents, being a student of the game, all that stuff. And I don't think Mitch was that. Right. He's um he's actually back in America now. We I think we got it wrong last time. We thought he was in Israel. He's actually back in America. Uh I think he's married now, he's got kids. Does he? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, hold yeah, on. Man, the we, last, so, last time we talked, you told me he was a fucking monk. <laughs> that sounds like some due diligence, think, James, that you should have done. We, yeah, he was, was a monk in Jerusalem. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> the land. 
you know. Uh, I was fucking I Mondo. He, Let's get Mondo on here and just fucking blast him. He's, um, I think his wife said, um, I think someone tagged his account or his wife's account. And his wife was like, yeah, it would have been great had they asked him to be part of it. Well, I'm like, I didn't know. <laughs> I only oh, just re- I only just realized that he was Dan Rodimer in Tough Enough. I didn't realize it was the same guy. Dan Rodimer is not Mitch. Well, on his fucking Wikipedia, it's unless it's wrong. Oh, no, Dan Rodimer, he's like a isn't he like a senator? He's like trying to run for Congress and stuff like that. Oh, like he's, dude, dude, did you ever see those fucking? He's ads? on Tough Enough. Yeah, yeah, but did you ever see those ads for Dad Rodimer? It's fucking brutal, dude. It's the corner I've ever seen. Yeah, I ran I, across it on Facebook. It was fucking brutal. And I like the guy. I like Big Dan. He's a nice guy. Oh, no, yeah. Dan was yeah. awesome. I remember in Tough Enough, they just told him just because he had like the short, curly kind of surfer hair. And when they were panning everyone in the ring for Tough Enough, you know, on Raw one night, he was like, <laughs> like this. And they told him, like, hey, keep making that face. Like, we we hate you. We want to hate you. Like he just yeah. like a prick. But like, hey, it helped him get signed. You know. Yeah. Oh, we got some more questions, dude. Oh, the, the internet lied to me. He said it was Dan Rodimer. I thought it can't be. Yeah, the internet so, lied. Wow. I've been lied to. Oh no. RT machine. Do these guys watch watch a mania? Yes, we do. <laughs> All the time. I don't. I don't even know what that is. Oh, you're so what? full of shit, Jeter. You don't know. I swear to God, botch mania is. I just know. I think. I've heard it called different things, but it's what is it? Just some like VHS tapes or something or DVDs of botched wrestling? No, it's like all kinds of current wrestling, modern day wrestling. Just oh, current. Jesus Christ! After the show I watched last night, they could have three full episodes of botches. Jr., <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for the super chat. Um, favorite Jim Cornette story? Did you ever get an invitation to the infamous hot tub? God damn, Jeter! That's a very specific question. <laughs> uh, I'll answer the second part. No, never got an invitation in the hot tub. I didn't even know you that was a thing. You, that you didn't get an invite. Did never got an invite to the hot tub. No, uh, man, a specific cornet story. Um, I don't know if I have a specific cornet story, but I do know cornet. Man, he just opened a ton of doors for me. Um, just moving from San Diego and then uh, they, they, him and Danny, it's a long story, but they ended up getting me a trial camp at HWA um, with WWE. I think Les Thatcher was running HWA at the time. Um, but just between that and allowing me in the beginner's class, advanced class, putting me on TV, getting me my program with Canyon, um, getting signed and even actually trying to showcase me with, with, you know, wrestling Jericho or tagging with Kane or, or wrestling Kane and, or, um, you know, tagging with Benoit and all that. I mean, dude, that, that's six flags, super summer sizzling series. I mean, there was a summer where he just gave me a lot of marquee matches with WWE guys. And, you know, he didn't have to do that. Think of the talent pool at OVW. So I was very fortunate, grateful, um, that he gave me that opportunity. So I have nothing bad to say about, uh, Jimmy. Uh, he, he really helped me in my career. I wouldn't have made it as far as I did, um, without him. Oh, with that no, being said, know, sorry. where's Paul London? Paul, where is Paul London? I thought he was coming. I'll yeah. message him now. Uh, let me just ask you this one and I read it. Uh, this is a good one for you as well, Renee. Um, we've watched Dark Side of the Ring. Um, thank you, Real Country Videos. Uh, Dark Side of the Ring is starting a new series, uh, about Ring Tales for the Territories. Mm. Um, I think uh, The Rock has actually got something to do with it. And he said it the history of Atlantic Grand Prix wrestling would be cool. We actually did one for the Fight Network. I think it aired like last year or the year before they came here and interviewed my dad, which that was like the only interview my dad ever done, right? And I guess it was it was very well well put together. I didn't get a chance to see it myself, but but the dark side, where what are they gonna bring up? Like bad shit? Or what um, Dark Side of the Ring, isn't it? So uh probably <laughs> Right. <laughs> probably, yeah. Probably, yeah. I will say the dark, the dark, dark stuff's always the fun stories that. You well, that's what people want to hear, right? They want to hear all the fucking drama and shit, right? Oh, there's always a ton, but and those are the yeah. I don't. I, I yeah. <laughs> it's great when you're not on the receiving end of it. <laughs> yeah, there's. I mean, God, I could. You could just name guys. I'm sure we could tell some stories about them. Probably one, but but yeah. Um, we yeah, told stories yeah. about someone associated with OVW. Well, we didn't tell the stories. 
I guess did. And sorry, what was what was your question? James, you're frozen, and now we can't hear you. You are frozen. Sorry, yeah, I was just messaging. Can you hear me now? Okay, now yep. we can yeah. see you. You're moving. Okay, yeah. good. Sorry, I was just mentioning Paul. Um, yeah, you have to be careful you tell stories about because uh, you get threatened with lawsuits otherwise. Right? Yep. We'll, t- we'll tell you off camera, Johnny. <laughs> okay, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, off camera. Uh, Monster Matt 345, thank you for the super chat. Hi, guys. Love the show. When I was younger, I believed in wrestling and hated the Spirit Squad. Respect for you now, though, Johnny. Was it hard to be tag champs on the show that hated tag team wrestling? That's a good question. Was it hard to be tag champs on a show that hated tag team wrestling? Well, Meaning like it? Office and Raw hated hated tag team wrestling? Is that yeah, but the, was, John, the Spirit Squad was Vince's idea, so you know he was gonna push it to the moon, right? Yeah. I, I don't I don't recall ever I mean if if I mean I don't know. I don't know how he would know that. And thank you for the question, by the way. I don't know if management didn't like tag team wrestling or they didn't. Who knows what? But I never, I never got that impression. I, I mean, they, they put the t- tag titles on us. They uh, let us wrestle Kane and Big Show. You know, uh, Flair and uh, Dusty Rhodes, DX. I mean, like, you know, Caden Murdoch, Highlanders. I mean, like, I mean, for the entire time we were up there, we were a tag team. You know, I never got the impression that they didn't, you know respect or like tag team wrestling i you know they pushed us to the moon and i was very grateful they put us with vince and and shane i i mean so to that regard it was i had a i had a blast being a tag team champion it was a lot of fun um there's a level of pressure i think that goes with that you want to deliver and i think being in the group of five you want to stand out in whatever way i think kenny wore his headband i wore a beanie sometimes uh you tried to make yourself stand out because, again, you don't know what's going to happen after you break up, you know, or who's going to go singles, who's going to stay as a tag, you know. So you kind of want to, you know, make yourself stand out despite being, you know, and you don't want to always be thinking of tomorrow, um, thinking, oh, what am I going to do after the Spirit Squad? You want to, you're in the Spirit Squad. So be in the moment, you know, right. enjoy it and uh, make the most out of it and be the best tag team you can. And I think at that point, it, it, you know, at some point we did do that um, and uh, we had a great time. Yeah. What was it like being part of the story that reunited DX? Because that was a big story because, I mean, they stopped tagging in 98 because Sean left the company and this was 06. So this was the first time in eight years the two of them tagged. So what was it like being part of that story? Oh, it was awesome. Um, Yeah, I just, I mean, what do you say? I mean, I think... uh, who We were beating up, what, Hunter in the ring? And then I think Sean came out and, and threw Mitch... And who, by the way, had his whole back torn up and he was wearing <laughs> that probably hurt like hell. Um, so uh, but yeah, no, just being in the ring with those guys that you watch growing up and dude, they're so light and they're so funny in there. Like and putting matches together with those guys was I mean, you're intimidated, like, but they were super cool. They tried to make us not feel that way. Um, I remember we were putting I, I, don't, I may have told you guys this on your lot in the last podcast I was on with you guys, but um, we were putting together a match. We did two two segments and uh they're like what do you guys want to do like whatever you guys want to do you know sirs and they're they're like no seriously what do you guys want to do like hey you know we've only been wrestling you know a blink of an eye you guys obviously know you guys tell us you know but we're happy to do whatever you know whatever you guys want to do right they're like what do you guys want to do or what do you guys think we should do and then we're talking we're like well we have two segments why don't we get like you know a mini heat on sean um and then you kind of blow you know a, a mini comeback and then we'll cut you off you know, before the break, we'll get a heat on you. And then, uh, you know, so you guys both get comebacks. We have a longer heat on you. They just look at each other like, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and we were like, oh, <laughs> shit. They took our idea. <laughs> <laughs> Which it was my idea, by the way. Uh, not that that matters. It's a team effort, but yeah. Dude, uh, <laughs> I, remember, I remember Sean not liking, uh, uh, what's the guy with the headband's name? Kenny. Ken- Kenny? Kenny, yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't crazy about him at all. Uh, I think I don't remember. I mean, if he wasn't, he never. I mean, I he never vocalized it to me. I think those guys genuinely enjoyed working working with us. Um, but I know, you know, you know, we've all done a lot of growing up since then. You know what I mean? So I think you know we were like brothers. You know, we you know we argued, we fought a little bit. You know, just like anyone, but we always made up and came together and i think uh i think again we were living in a bubble back then so 
you're 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 making the most of the spirit squad but you're also thinking in the short term but you're also thinking thinking how long is this going to last once it once it ends what am i going to do so we were all thinking about that because we just had this gut feeling it wasn't going to last long or forever so i think thinking of it in terms like that it almost became like someone said hey you know the agent goes we need someone to come off the top rope and kenny goes i'll do it it's like well why don't we talk about it you, maybe you did something last week on raw that made you stand out why don't you let you know kenny or or sorry like mitch or myself or mondo stand out um so i i think there was that a little bit but as far as sean not liking mitch i mean i, I wasn't aware of that cool um our team machine thank you for the super chat uh what did you guys watch back in the 90s raw or nitro i watched both mm -hmm. flip channels yeah money night wars you'd always be flipping channels yeah yeah, yeah. i yeah. think i i think growing up i <laughs> because i had access to it and over here in the uk i had more access to wcw so I watch a lot more of Nitro, but then when I started getting more access to WWE, around about 99, 2000, that's when I started getting back into WWE. But it was weird, though, because all the people I grew up watching, like Hogan, Savage and all that, it was on Nitro anyway. So it was just, like, seamless for me. Right. With that being said, where's Paul? Messaged him. Uh, you know, Paul, he's a free spirit. Yeah, where is uh, – was he supposed to be on at three? Uh – yeah, six yeah. Eastern. Which, yeah, three o'clock California time. Yeah, I think he's in the gym. I think he said he was coming out the gym, so he said I will be on the show. So, oh, okay. we'll see. Uh, ben Hinn Marsh, uh, question for you, Johnny. Yeah, uh, well, both of you. How did you get on with uh, Chris Canyon in OVW? No oh, man. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll start with uh, Canyon was awesome. He came down because he was injured um, during the invasion angle. And uh, I mean, it's Chris Canyon, WWE superstar, you know, and, and I, I don't know why, but um, I don't know if we were in the advanced class yet or what, but um, I don't think we were. No, maybe. No, we were. Um, but can't, you'd think that all the, the contracted talent would be picking Canyon's brain to, to, you know, hey, work with me. You know, what do you know? Like just he's got years and years of knowledge. Like um, and maybe to some degree, they some guys were doing that. But for some reason, Canyon kind of was really drawn to myself chris cage mark magnus and sean o'hare sean o'hare's younger brother we were all living together in um indiana i forget what was the, i don't know clarksville indiana um so we would yeah he would work in class with us after practice and just kind of chain around i got i got, actually got some stuff on vhs i need to put on digital um but practice matches and just just working with us and teaching us psychology and moves and just um just pacing in the ring um and then afterwards he would uh uh stay after with us at our house and watch tapes with us and we just analyze it um you know he was just super cool and i think he asked Cornette to work with me on tv and this was before i was before i was signed actually yeah and then uh, we had a match and it that that really elevated my my career in a sense of helping me get noticed and potentially get signed um and it was all a lot of that was Canyon, but he was he was incredible. Bought me a limo for my or got me rented a limo for my 21st birthday. Got me my first MP3 player. Um, we all went out, partied that night. Um, yeah, man, Canyon, I think just genuinely, I think he liked being around us because it made him remember why he loved the business. I think he was at a point where he might have been a little not jaded, but maybe just a little burnt out, especially on the on the back of everything that happened at WCW. Um, but I think being around us who are just so excited just to be at OVW, to watch tape, to, we were laughing at, at guys and, you know, I don't know. I think he just enjoyed that atmosphere and it kind of made him remember why he loves it. So, no, Canyon was awesome. I saw a depression with him when he was there because I remember yeah. specifically being at your apartment and he was, he lived with you guys? Wasn't he living on the fucking... No, he didn't live with us, but he was there a lot. Just yeah. we were, I mean, we had an open door. I mean, everyone was coming in and out of our place a lot. Yeah. I remember a lot. He was lying on the ground, just watching wrestling and like eating ice cream, but you could just tell he was depressed. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, he, yeah, he, he, I think he always had that side to him. And I think he kind of hit it well, but every now and again, it, it'd come out. And like, I, like, I mean, obviously, Canyon's gay. I think everyone knows that. And I think, but at the time, no one knew. 
and then he went on TV and they did this angle where I think Big Show was giving Undertaker all these presents week after week on SmackDown. The one of the I think it was the last one. But they put Canyon dressed up as Boy George in makeup and everything in the bot like in a box. And he came out and he had to sing. And it's like I remember when he came back after that, he just was like, "Bro, he's like my family watches that. Like, how would that make you feel if they did that to you? You know?" And he, he just was so defeated about that. And um, yeah, there was another thing, no, another story I'll I'll tell that I don't think anyone knows. I've never told this story to anybody actually. Uh, but so along, so when we were on the road as a Spirit Squad, uh, we were wrestling somewhere uh, and. Uh, uh, Canyon asked for some tickets and he said, Hey, put them under my friend's name and five or six tickets. And he had been released, you know? Um, so I did it and got him tickets. And then, so, but I don't know. I don't know if we were, no, we were wrestling that night. Um, so then, uh, I think DX had a match against someone else that night, not us. And apparently he walked to the ring from the stands, just walked down the stands. I think he was holding some indie belt and he had a sign saying, um, Hey Hunter, why did Vince fire me? And then he flipped it around and the sign said, um, pray for my gay soul. Now I think he was on antidepressants and he was probably taking a lot of stuff back then, maybe drinking and who knows how that affects your mental state. But I don't know if he was in his right mind when he did that. But I remember they came to the back and everyone was talking about it. And I remember people were like, you know, Jeter, did you know he was going to be here? Because they knew Cage Magnus and I were tight with him. And I was like, I had no idea. I'm not going to say, I, hey, I got him. You know, I got the tickets under Cl Chris Clusoritis or whatever his name was. I, it wasn't Canyon. They didn't know that. Um, but I was terrified. I'm like, they find out that I got him tickets. He's going to get fired. But shortly, I don't, I don't think, well, I don't know what the time frame was. I think it was less than a year later, Canyon committed suicide. So I think he, after he left, he was in a really dark place. Um and looking back, man, I, I, I wish I would have reached out more because something imagine if like someone, you know, did that. Like if Renee did that at a WWE show, I'd be like, I'd probably call him be like, what the fuck? Or sorry, what the hell? Like, you know, why would you do that? Are you OK? Like, let's talk. Like, what? why did you feel the need to do that? You know, or I don't know. I think I had a relationship with Canyon where I think we could have been we could have talked to him about what was going on. And looking back, I wish I would have done that because he was a really, really good dude who just kind of went through a lot, a lot of traumatic stuff that just, uh, you know, didn't end well for him. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, Sean O'Hare's brother earlier, Johnny Sean O'Hare. Um, have you heard the story between him and Jim Cornette? Renee's told it before. Sh Shan and, and Jimmy? Yeah. No, but I want to hear it. I could tell you some Shan O'Hare stories. Yeah, I would love to hear this story. <laughs> okay, so were you there the night? And Sean O'Hare, everybody. Probably. That was, yeah, I, I'm sure you were there, but that Sean O'Hare was Sean O'Hare's younger brother. Yes. And he had a dark match. Now, Shan was very well endowed. He had a very large uh, reproductive member. And he was wearing these tights. I don't remember that about him, but okay. <laughs> well, no, it was, it was very visible. You could see it through the tights right. he was wearing. He was For wearing sure. like the, yeah. the tight shorts, you know? Yeah. So they're doing the dart match, and I guess Jimmy's doing the commentary to test out the mics and stuff. And then as soon as Shan gets to the back, you can hear fucking Jimmy cussing and swearing from, you know how Danny's office was there? Oh, the floor, and, yeah. and then there was that main office, right, that where we, the TV room. So he, yeah. he slammed the door. He gets in there. What the fuck? You think this is a goddamn joke? Stuff in your fucking tights? And then Shan was like, Jimmy, you're real tough. My dick's just that big. <laughs> <laughs> well, goddamn. Goddamn. We're new tights. Come to my hot tub. Oh, my God. I miss Jimmy. <laughs> oh, that was hilarious. Yeah, I think I vaguely remember that. No, Shan was an uh, interesting dude. Uh, I don't I don't know what he's doing or where maybe he's a monk in you know Jerusalem uh, <laughs> living his best with uh yeah who oh who was it Mitch yeah maybe maybe he's living over there with Mitch but uh yeah Shan I remember no I shouldn't tell the story no. but it's <laughs> yeah anyway he was an interesting dude I don't know yeah very interesting good uh Loads more super chats here. Uh, we'll just go through them as we go along. Um, Jared Aviat, thank you for the super chat. Hi, James, Renee, and the great Johnny Jeter. 
the great joint eater. Great. The great. Uh, just wondering <laughs> if you guys had any stories of Carly to go backstage in WWE, being in a bad mood or being grumpy. So being Carlito. <laughs> um, towards the end of my run there, he was very, very grizzled. I think a lot of, oh yeah, you get to that point. Because when he first got in, right, he got the huge push because I think he pinned, yeah, he won against Cena and won the U.S. title his first night in, right? Yeah. But after a while, what happens is that, you know, you're up here, but then you get put down here and someone else gets that top spot. And then when you're down here and you're not making the same amount of money, you, you start being grizzled, right? I think that happens to everybody. Or they're not right. using you as much, right? 100%, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, re- I remember him wanting to quit, and they wouldn't let him. Yeah. They wouldn't let him leave. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't remember him. I mean, I remember him being grizzled about his push and where he was at on the card and stuff like that. And trust me, like Renee said, like, you do go. You're getting pushed. You're making money, and then all of a sudden you're not. And it's noticeable. So, you know, and plus, yeah, you pay for all your, they pay for your flights, but you're paying for your rental car. You're paying for your hotel rooms. You're paying for your, your meals. Um, That eats up a lot of money. And again, times were different back in, you know, 2006, 2007 um, than they are now. These guys are getting paid through the roof from what I hear, but compared to what we were making back then, um, at least the downside guarantee was, I mean, you could always make your, you know, percentage of the gate, depending on where you are on the card, Plus your percentage of the pay per view, you know, buy rates, all that stuff, your your royalties every quarter, um, but it is noticeable, and it's not like some guys were probably making a ton of money if if they're draws, and I think Carlito was a draw to some degree, but um, it is noticeable the pay disparage. So um, I don't remember him really going out of his way to voice his 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 displeasure with that, but I'm sure he was upset. Yeah, I remember. Um, well, this. This is when I was very first started podcasting. Um, it's about two years ago. I interviewed his uh, cousin Epico. Do you remember him? Cousin Epico? <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> Hell of a name. No. No. He tagged with Primo, Carlito's brother. You don't know him either, do you, Jeter? Mm-hmm. I, know, I know Primo Cologne, but I don't know. What was his name again? His gimmick name was Epico. His real name was Orlando. Epico, Orlando, not Orlando. I know one Orlando. <laughs> no, it's not that Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> Orlando Jordan. Uh, well, no, I don't uh, know. I asked him if there was any because Kelly was there uh, released at this point or he left. And I said, was there any plans on bringing him back for you to be like a trio? And um, he said they offered him a contract, and the contract, like the money, he said was like developmental money. And he was a big star yeah. when he left. Um, did you have, did you catch his return a couple of years ago at the Royal Rumble? Yeah, where he looked like he was put on about thirty five pounds of muscle. Oh, Carlito, yeah, yeah he looked he was jacked. Fucking jacked. Jacked. Well, hey, yeah, I mean, come on. If they said, "Hey, Johnny, Renee, James, we want you to be we want you to be number twenty eight at the Royal Rumble," I'd I'd go out of my way. So I have super soldier serum, Captain America serum right there. <laughs> you see that little bottle right there? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is, probably just water, but I would be taking that. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you, super soldiers. Uh, congratulations, Johnny. You're going to be a dad. Oh, thank you very much, man. Yeah, November 10th is the due date. It's uh, wow. getting, the, getting the room ready. It's uh, it's crazy, man. It's, uh, I'm, I'm reading the books. It's it's a lot of stuff to to know that I didn't know. It's kind of scary a little bit. Oh, yeah. So that, thought, whole, that whole crew, man, you're all going to be fathers now. You're, yeah. Um, well, Magnus, like the spirit- Magnus got oh. like 10 kids, doesn't he? Magnus, I think he has two or three. Um, Matt, yeah, Cage has a kid. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm having one. Uh, I think Antonio Promise Thomas has kids. Romeo Roselli has kids. I'm going through the OVW roster. Um, I think that Rory, yeah, Callister, they a lot of, yeah, doing a lot of, I would say a lot of Mickey James. She has kids. I mean, dude, Beth Phoenix has kids. I mean, dude, everyone has kids, uh, more or less. I think there's some, I don't think Idol Stevens has any. Um, Nova has kids. I mean, yeah, fair amount, you know. Oh, dude, I'm wrestling Robbie McAllister Saturday. Are you? Yeah, I got a three awesome. day weekend uh, starting tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Nova Scotia. 
Oh, cool. So cool That's to catch up with him. I haven't seen him. How are you? How, how are you enjoying those uh, overseas tours? You think? I think you did Japan for a fair amount of time, right? I was there about four months. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Uh, did you, I mean, is that? That's a long time, man, for a tour. Yeah, well, I lived there for three years, right? Yeah, I know, but you don't live there now, and you're gone from home for four months. That's a. I, I, called, I don't think I could do that for four months. See, that's called months. it's called the fucking paying your dues, brother. In okay, case the sacrifice, okay, man. Dues. <laughs> My sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> that's a crazy. Where's reference. Paul London? I'll message him again in a minute. Yeah, um, I have I have 13 minutes, by the way. Uh, just letting you guys know, I have to, um, I have to uh, you know. Uh, Team Machine, thank you again. Uh, have you guys seen UWF Dark Side of the Ring episode? Johnny Ace worked for UWF. I need to start watching those. I haven't I haven't seen them, but uh, I wouldn't say I'm the biggest fan of Johnny Ace. Um, so I don't know. You know if you got wanna... right, John? Yeah, I heard about that. You know, uh, I. I don't want to. I don't want to bad mouth the guy. I'm just not the, not the biggest fan of him. But and it's not surprising to me that he that he's gone. Um, so I don't know if I would want to. I'm sure the story is interesting. Uh, I just don't know if I want to waste an hour of my life watching a story about Johnny Ace. I could find nine million better things to do than watch a story about Johnny Ace. Bunga <laughs> uh, so, bunga. Sorry. Jeter's only got 13 minutes, so we got to rush through these. Oh, yep. That's on Alex Wright. I never met him. I'm sure he's, I love his dancing. Played him a few times in WCW uh, versus it NWO. No, maybe it was WCW Revenge. Uh, yeah, yes. I used to play him as a character. Never met him, though. Loved, the, loved his uh, dancing. What was, the, what was the name of him in Disco? Was it the Boogie Knights, the tag team? Oh, my God. Yeah, they'd come out and Wright would be, be like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Alex Wright versus Glacier. You know, <laughs> we need to bring Glacier on. I would yes, love to do. get Glacier on. We do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, Arty Machine, thank you again. Uh, Arty Machine's been a beast tonight. Uh, what do you guys uh, do in a wrestling match with two segments? Uh, what do you do in the commercial break? Grab a hold or throw the guy to the outside of the ring and get your breath. <laughs> <laughs> do little to nothing and then as soon as like your 10 minutes or 10 seconds for you to come out throw them back in the ring snap mare hold come back in commercial they're going do pre do pre and i'm just like no 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 and, you know, yeah it's like clockwork throw them in the ring 10 sec you know 10 seconds okay put them in a hold hopefully the crowd's coming at that point yep. Enormous, Peter. Thank you for super chat. Um, what would be a good topic for Dark Side of the Ring? What would you like to be? What would you like to see touched that hasn't been? Uh, I think the current predicament with Vince McMahon and the up to now twenty million dollars in NDAs. That'd be good. Yeah. Uh, I think for me, I. Um, I don't know. I. I don't know if they'd be stories that you could tell in an hour or whatnot, but like I know I feel like wrestlers need a union, and I feel like you could you could bring light or you know at least um, tell stories about how you know taken advantage of. I think to some degree wrestlers are because you're like cattle up there. You know, you get injured. It's not like there's you know three backup quarterbacks behind you where someone can just take your spot. There's wrestlers, but there's only one Johnny Jeter. There's only one Dupree. Like you're gone you're you know you're hurt you're you're off tv and that's your livelihood and hopefully you you come back but i mean guys are afraid to lose their spot so they work through injuries you know concussions you know they don't want to go to the hospital or even though you have an insurance card i don't care what they say like oh you're an adult you should do that blah 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 but at the time no there was a fear of being hurt or giving the impression that you were hurt so a lot of guys man you just sucked it up um and which wasn't healthy and i think from an hr standpoint i don't think that would fly today. Um, and on top of that, just, you know, no benefits considering, you know, how much you're working, um, no 401k. Uh, yeah, I, I think, I think shining a light on that may not be the most glamorous thing is, uh, you know, something like Vince McMahon's story, but um, that is something that affects, affected everyone out there. Well, that's the thing. That's why guys would swallow a bunch of fucking pills. Yeah. The master pain making it. And that's all it did is make it worse. Right. Yeah, because you weren't feeling anything. That's it. 
I mean, someone we've spoken about, obviously, with Paul, because obviously Paul used to date her, um, Ashley Mazzaro, and obviously there's a story, whether it's true or not, we don't know, but over in one of the tribute troops that she got sexually assaulted by some U.S. Marines. Oh, really? That story is out there, yeah. I don't know who brought yeah, it to life, but that story. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, she, I think that. I think she claimed it. I don't know if she tried to sue him. Um, WWE, I think WWE put a counter to, but WWE said that Ashley sent in a handwritten letter to apologize, but WWE has never published this letter. So if the letter exists, I don't know, but I personally don't believe it is. You know what's also screwed up with that 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 story? After she suicided herself or whatever, her brother was killed outside yeah. of a yeah outside of a pizza shop the day he got out of rehab. Wow, oh God, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's pretty crazy too. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. You know, I never. I don't know. I never filed anything with HR back then, um, but I, I don't. Actually, I shouldn't speak to it. I don't know what HR was like at WWE back then. I just don't. I know a lot of us didn't report things we probably should have. And that, and to their credit, they could make the argument, well, you should have, you know, we would have acted right. on it, you know. So, right. Um, so I, I shouldn't say that, you know, anything about that. The thing is, and I'm going to speak for, I'm going to speak about this from an unwrestler. So I've had no ties to WWE. And you and like you said, Johnny, people people will say, "Well, why didn't you say anything while you're there?" The thing is, you were really young when you were there. Renee was nineteen, twenty. How old was you, Johnny? Early twenties, I would say. Yeah, mid twenties. Yeah. You are scared. This is your dream. This is your dream job. You know, if you say anything, you are going to get fired. You're going to get released. Yeah. That's why the that's why the likes of yourselves and as you can imagine how many more people didn't say anything because. They were scared, and and it's still like that. At least, with like, yeah, it's you know, I, again, I don't, I don't know, I can't speak to how it's like now, but back then, yeah, there was like these un, there was the policies and procedures of WWE that you know you would hope ever all the employees, talent, and corporate would adhere to, and then there's the unwritten rule book of pro wrestling: work injured, you know, you don't want to get fired, um, you know, don't don't complain. Um, be grateful, shake everyone's hands, watch the monitor. And then like, let's say for some reason you didn't shake someone's hand or maybe you ate the last chicken breast and catering and taker walks in. It's like, Oh, I'm fucking hungry. You know, like, Oh, Jeter ate the last chicken breast. Like <laughs> they'd probably, who knows? Maybe they throw a rotten protein shake in your, in your, on your gear and then chain your, your bag up in the stands or they cut your, I know Eminem for had their, uh, sleeves cut off their jackets. Um, and then it's like, well, do you say something? You go, Hey, this is horse shit or no you're told don't sell it don't put it over just go out there wear it and this and that and don't put it over and they say okay he can take a rib let's not mess with them but it's like you cut up your their fucking jackets those things were like probably two or three grand like and yeah. i can't say something like that's horse shit but again unwritten rule book you just you're lucky to be there you're grateful just yeah. just write it out don't put it over because if you sell anything up there they'll keep going and keep going and keep going so yeah <laughs> Right. Uh, most patient. thank you. Uh, any Eddie Umaga stories? I love Umaga. Hmm. He was a wild child. He was a wild one. He was. Yeah. Uh, nothing appropriate, I could tell. I'm trying to think of one that's... He was awesome. He he always had a great attitude. He was fun to work with. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I loved I loved Eki. He was, he was cool. Um, yeah, all the work here that he man. passed. Yeah, he all was. Of all the Samoans, I rank him as number one, as far as yeah, like he oh, could go. Fuck, unreal. Yeah. yeah. With that being said, Jeter, do you want to give one last plug to your uh, for your wrestling school? Yeah, let's do it. So, if you are in the Northern California area, specifically thirty minutes east of Sacramento, the city <laughs> is Cameron Park, California. Ladies and gentlemen, the Manticore Wrestling Academy is for you. Head trainer, <laughs> owner, operator, Johnny Jeter will teach you everything you need to know. Uh, we train Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, 6 to 8. And any information, any and all information you could find at manticorewrestlingacademy.com or find me on Instagram at Manticore Wrestling Academy or on Facebook at Manticore Wrestling Academy. Um, so, yeah, uh, feel free to reach out and uh, look forward to working with you. 
you know what's funny? Sorry, real thing before I go is uh, I told you I had four students. I've had more, but it's <laughs> when anytime they, they come in, I say, hey, look, you know, hey, don't sign up yet. Just come train, see if it's for you. Um, and then if you still want to continue training, you know, great. And if not, then that's OK, too. Sleep on it. I'll call you in the morning and then we'll, we'll figure it out. Right. But I tell them, I say, hey, look, under no circumstance do you throw up in my ring. You do that. I'll fucking kill you. Like, do not <laughs> throw up. I said the trash cans on the side of the house, or you can puke in right over there. Do not throw up in my ring. So these guys come in, and obviously, any wrestling school, they should take you through strength and conditioning drills. Because if you can't, you don't have the strength or conditioning to wrestle, you shouldn't be wrestling. So I put them through that, and you can just tell they just like turn white. Or they're just like, oh, or they, they have to sit down. Oh, I lost my breath. And, you know, hey, that happens to all of us. It happened to me my first day. Um, but I would say 90% of them go on the side of the house and, and puke their brains out. And then half the time they, or if not all the time, they quit. They say, hey, look, you know, um, I didn't realize the level of effort that um, it was going to take to be a pro wrestler. Um, I, I love it. I just don't think I can do it. And I say, hey, no problem. But I said, hey, look, you can always be a referee. You can always be a manager. There's other avenues, but you still got to do the strength and conditioning because those guys bump and do whatnot. Um, and they end up just tapping out. And then, and, and again, I, I'm glad that they at least tried it. So now they know it's not for them. But part of me yeah. is like, what did you think? Was, you know, what did you think? I think people watch it on TV. They think I could do that shit, you know, but then when they actually do it, they're like, wow, I actually have to be fit. I actually have to take bumps. This actually hurts. Or wow, I don't have the wind for this. My lungs are hurting. I have to throw up, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's a lot more than what you see on, on TV. So it's, it's, you know, as much as I would love 90,000 students, uh, you know, you kind of have to weed them out a little bit. Right. Yeah. Well, Johnny Jeter, I would like to thank you for coming on. I know you're a busy man and you got things to do. And I apologize for Paul London. Hopefully you'll be making a, a cameo here pretty yeah, soon. Yeah, I'm bummed he didn't show up. But please, uh, you know, tell him I said hi and, and that we missed him. And hopefully next time uh, we'll get to see him on the next, uh, if I'm ever invited back, on the next one. Oh, of course. Sir. You're always a trip, man. You're always fucking welcome to the show. <laughs> welcome to the cafe. All right, Johnny. <laughs> Take care, my friend. Take it easy, guys. Thanks again. Take care. Bye. 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 Okay. So, well, with that being said, where's Paul London? Mr. Jimmy, I think hopefully it'll come on soon. Um, so we'll we'll carry on discussing uh, AEW, what we did see. Um, <coughs> main, main of well, did you catch the tag team match between Andrade and Roosh against um, who was they against again? <laughs> Uh, one guy, I think, dressed in white, and he tried to, like, run the ropes, and then he fucking slipped and fell and ran in the middle of the ring. Oh, uh, Lucha Brothers. Yeah. Pentagon and Phoenix. Phoenix is always fucking watching. Yeah. I mean... When, uh, he, when he lands something, it's great, but the problem yeah. is he fails the other 99 times. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's like, man, unless you can hit it 100% of the time, why even go for it, right? Hmm. I like Bruce, uh, um, the Hispanic with the long hair. Yes. Uh, you, we spoke about him uh, last week, his match against uh, Moxley. And uh, he was a former Ring of Honor champion. So um, I reckon he's actually got a bright future. He's pretty talented. And I saw at the end, was Andrade wearing like baseball player pants? I think it, yeah, it's kind of like, I think they're trying to be like, Mexican cartel kind of thing. Oh. That, I think that's kind of like the gimmick, really. They're like the cartel and it's like business suit pants, but kind of thing. Oh. And then I noticed at the end, which um, basically shows that I'm, I'm right, that everybody tries to rip off the Japanese because you notice they did the little pose at the end where they're copying off Naito from New Japan. Hmm. Did you notice that at the end? They did the, like a little roll and they laid down on the mat yeah. and had their hands like this. Yeah. And then they like posed. And then you got John Moxley who's copying at Sushi Anita. And then CM Punk made his comeback who he copies every single Japanese wrestler there is. Mm. <sighs> it's um, Moxley. I try with him, but 
it's like every match he has to bleed. It's yeah, you got you got busted open rock. again, right? What, what is he fucking Abdul the Butcher? I used to think Ric Flair bled <laughs> in these matches. <laughs> He's got nothing on Moxley. Ah, uh, I mean, what happens <laughs> when you do that every week? It doesn't but, mean anything. Anyway, the per- the- well, it's like the opening match. So you had Darby Allen against uh, Brody King. It was like a coffin match, casket match. Where, uh, yeah, it's a coffin match, actually. And um, it was a fun little match. But, and, um, but they'd done everything. Guys were bleeding. There was a hanging. And Sting came out, batted everyone with a baseball bat. It's like they'd done everything in that first match. And then you had the tag team match where it was 100 miles an hour. I didn't realize it was a tornado tag. I thought, how come these people ain't dagging? But then I realized it was a tornado. And it's like, it doesn't give you a chance to breathe. It's like, go, 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 which, yeah, I suppose it should be good. It should be just full action entertainment. But I don't know. It's like they throw everything out first, and then you've got your low in the middle, and then you've got your end. But I just can't get behind Moxley. Um, I'm trying. And he's trying to be a stone coat, flipping the beds, and you'll never be a stone coat. But he's over, though, right? Like, from what I understand, like... He's over. I just don't know how <laughs> he's over. <laughs> um, kind of funny. There's a... I'm not going to mention this guy from the, by name because he's probably looking for a rub because he's bored and just got no one to talk about. But a five-time sucker is currently live streaming. We've actually got double the amount of live stream viewers than he has. Can you dig it? <laughs> this, this guy's got over 600,000 subscribers. I wonder how many of them's been paid for, sucker. Right, right. See, I just found out for everybody listening that you can actually buy subscribers and you can buy likes too, right? See, yeah, yeah. I'm not aware of this. Yeah, I'm very uh, ignorant, naive when it comes to this kind of thing. So, so people actually do that. They buy subscribers to make themselves look bigger, or is that it? Uh, yeah, I knew you could buy subscribers. I didn't know about likes or something because I would have. Like I'm, I got no idea, but I would imagine because of bots and things. I don't know if it's bots or if it's like a a team they've got. What does this like tells people to subscribe? Got no idea, but I've heard it's pretty common for a lot of people to um, buy subscribers and stuff. I, I don't understand why, because it's just empty subscribers. And look, I, I've mentioned you to Renee, uh, Renee, and everyone. I'm not bragging about our numbers because. We're not a massive podcast. We're just, we're still starting, but I have seen podcasts that's uh, you know wrestling podcasts with Paula Famous and such who has got more subscribers. But yet our views are better pound for pound. Our views are better, and I don't know how many subscribers it's other people's got as genuine or if they're bought for. But um, I don't see the point of it. I rather grow an organic fan base, and we we've got a great fan base. I love every single one of you who comments but what's the point of buying subscribers there's got to be there's got to be a reason i don't know but um is there any more uh, super chat questions yeah i think we've got a few actually um aiden stevenson uh thank you for the super chat uh what's your guys thoughts on the rocks rap have you listened to that renee i did not i love it really anything he does is golden let's let's leave it at that because whatever Uh, he touches turns to gold I don't know how to put it on here, but um, it, I don't know the name of the artist. I'm not really, even though I'm still in my early 30s, I'm I'm completely out of touch with modern music. And right. um, he does a rap at the end of the song. And it, he apparently done it in one take, and it's awesome. <laughs> but um, I can't fault The Rock. The Rock is just, like, perfect, isn't he? He's just great. He's talented, man. What's the next question? Uh, Super Mario, thank you for the $10 Super Chat. Uh, James and Renee, congrats on 10 k Thank you so much. Uh, Johnny, the Marvel figures in the background are super awesome. But yeah, I first spoke to Johnny about that. I wanted to say keep the, doing what you guys are doing. Aloha from Hawaii. Aloha! Actually, Hawaii, I gotta... You know who should we bring back on here is Tayo Kea. Yes. Uh, I want to bring him on here for a live, especially if the fans like Japanese wrestling. Uh, he'd be great there. Plus, just his stories. He's got some great Johnny A stories. He was around him for I numerous imagine, years. Yeah. yeah. And he saw him from a different light. He saw him as a talent as opposed to administration, right? 
Yeah. So, that Kea come back on here. Yeah. Hopefully, and Paul, where are you? Hopefully, he will be joining us soon. There, uh, everyone, we will um, get. He will make an appearance. Uh, the champ. Will Spirit Squad ever have a reunion of all the members? It would be good to see. Um, I love Johnny G. He's such. Char- he's so charismatic. Yeah. No, Johnny didn't reach his full potential as far as a talent. He could have done so much more. But you can say that for a lot of guys, right? So many guys. Um, I, I, wouldn't be, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be. Well, didn't they have a Spirit Squad reunion uh, on SmackDown? Yeah. A, yeah, kinda. It was in uh, 2016. Right. Uh, Miss was having a feud with Sigler, uh, Nick, Nem- uh, Nick Key and Spirit Squad, as he was known as. Yeah. And um, for the IC title, and it was kind of like, I think. Um, let me get this right. It was one or two. I think uh, Miss was IC champ, and Sigler was putting his career on the line. And weeks leading up to it, they brought back uh, Kenny and uh, Mondo. Right. And um, I, I think Johnny actually told a story on the previous interview on our previous episode where he couldn't get f- to it for some reason because the company he works for kind of dealt with WWE or something like that, and he couldn't do it for some r- bizarre reason. Yeah, yeah, that um, was the whole politics behind it. Yeah, and no, uh, they, it, they were um, they were auditors. They were be actually <laughs> auditing WWE. That's so right. Have, yeah, they couldn't have somebody from their company work there while they were auditing WWE. Yeah. And they didn't know where Mitch was. <laughs> and he was um, in the man- monastery. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that was that. So yeah, it'd be nice to see him. I think you mentioned last time, uh, would love to see a uh, La Resistance v Spirit Squad uh, match. Yeah. If there's any promoters out there that would want to, I think Sly is up for it. I don't know if I am. My body's hurting. But back to AEW. Um, the women's match. It was the Jade Cargill who is visually, like that's what I'm talking about. When you're flipping the channels and you see that. She's like China. She's got a presence. She fucking right. She has a yes. superstar look. As far as the work, God damn it, honey, change something. Because again, needs to, work, needs to work to our strengths. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like don't try to don't do shit you're not ready to do. Because she's still green. She's green and goose shit. Yeah, and a lot of that stuff was just so see through. And uh, yeah, it's uh, and that, well, she was against uh, Madison Rain, who's been in TNA now for wow. A long time, about fifteen years. I think she's been TNA for. Uh-huh. And it's a shame because when she came out, it was literally <laughs> crickets. Right. And uh, and I think she's actually signed on now to be like a backstage producer for AEW. Really? Yeah. I know she threw an insiguri and got Jade right, like in the hip. Yeah. I tell you, she's married to Renee. You, you remember uh, Josh Matthews? Are they married? Yeah, she's married to him. Because uh, he, well, he's in TNA. Well, it's Impact Wrestling now, but he's in TNA. He's he's probably one of the main figureheads over there now. He's kind of worked himself up from commentator to interviewer to like backstage management. Is he still there? He's still there. God damn! You got wow. any uh, Josh Matthews stories? Was that? You got any stories on Josh Matthews? Not really. He was no. he was brought in from tough enough. And you tell he loved the wrestling business, you know. Not a bad guy, but never really interacted with him that much. But he's managed to keep a job in the business for Christ twenty years. Yeah, he's done so well. Yeah. Um, got another question here. Uh, thank you, everyone. If you just want to send in questions, please do so. Uh, hopefully, Paul will be joining us. Um, if not, just uh, just barrage him on Twitter. <laughs> just keep just barrage him on Twitter and tell him to get his ass on the show. We're waiting. <laughs> um, RT Machine, thank you again for the super chat. You've been great tonight. Uh, how many wrestlers was in one locker room? And was there any wrestler who had their own locker room in WWE? Oh. Um, I Nobody had their own locker room. I remember Hogan, when he came in, he liked to dress by himself. 
Yeah. Yeah, Hogan would dress by himself, but for the most part, everybody would no, everybody would dress together. Or Even for were... Oh yeah. Oh well. Wow. Yeah, yeah. No, he uh I mean like maybe sometimes on overseas tours, like him, Flair, and maybe Sean would go off in a corner, they'd be huddled together or whatever, but no, I never noticed anything like, like that to where they would isolate themselves, you know. Nothing like that. That's good to hear, actually. Yeah. Personally, because um, obviously, you know, Brett Hartmark, and in his book, he always felt like he was one of the boys because he would always dress with the boys, whereas in An Ultimate Warrior, and I, I, I was a fan of Warrior growing up, growing up, but he would want his own locker room. And uh, I think he... Um, he kind of, if I'm wrong, I do apologize, but I think it kind of said the click kind of wanted their own locker room, but it didn't happen. Oh, really? Unless I'm wrong on that, but I'm sure he said it. Unless I'm just wrong, everyone. If I am, I do apologize, but I'm sure I saw that in the book. Oh, maybe. I can't, I can't confirm or deny that. Bunga Bunga, get Sheik on to put a late London in a camel clutch. <laughs> Paul. Have you ever Where met is, Sheik, Renee? I actually worked with the Sheik in England. Oh, wow. A, yeah, it was Doncaster, England, 1PW, right? And they yeah. brought in Sheik, and he was managing the guy that I was wrestling, okay? So before, I, and I was all jacked up, so before I got in the ring, he got on the microphone, and he said, you look like Ultimate Warrior Jabroni. <laughs> <laughs> and then we started wrestling, right? And I started doing like high drop kicks and kind of like flying elbows and stuff. And then Sheik was cheering for me and bashing the guy he was managing because the guy he was managing wasn't really up to par. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> it was funny. Um, Paul's just written. He's trying to join him, but his camera's not working. Um Right, I'm going to tell him what to do. Renee, I'll just ask you this question while I'm telling him what to do. Okay. Uh, AEW copies a lot of WCW storylines, in his opinion. Uh, have you got any comment on that while I'm just talking to Paul? Um, let's see. I haven't been watching long enough to actually notice. Um, I do get a WCW feel from AEW. However, it's like the latter years, unfortunately, when it wasn't as good. Uh, yeah, from what I saw, like I said, they got a lot of talent. A lot of guys can go, a lot of guys can do stuff, but unfortunately, I don't know if it's out of nervousness or just inexperience, but they're botching a lot of moves. And thank God for the audience, because the audience seems to be the most, like, forgiving yeah, audience ever, right? It's not yeah. like a ECW Philadelphia fucking crowd where they're going to chant, you fucked up up at every yeah. move, right? Very they're devoted. I will give them credit, the AEW. They've got a very, very devoted audience. Yeah. And I give them a lot of credit for that. So um, it's like we know every company fucks up, but the thing with AEW, when they first started, we're going to be this alternative. We're going to be giving the wrestlers health insurance, all these things. And none of it come to pass. There's been no health insurance for the wrestlers. Um, as for being an alternative WWE, they're not a slight different style in wrestling. They wrestle a bit faster, but they're basically it's the same thing as what WWE, uh, WWE is. And uh, there's some parts I enjoyed of the show. Um, I, I like. Uh, I don't know if you caught it. Ricky Starks. He, he kind of has rock mannerisms. Does he? Uh, yeah, I, 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 get, I get confused with all these guys. Yeah, it's um, it, like he's a young guy. Uh, he's got a similar. I can see like a young rock in him. Um, Ravi be bigger than rock. I don't know, but he's got charisma. There's people I like. I love the uh, the acclaimed. Uh, they wasn't on the show, but um, but it's uh, two guys. One raps to the ring, and the other guy's like he's hype man. But uh, they've got charisma. And uh, so um, they, they, they've grown on me. Um, but yeah, but then I watch a Moxley. I just can't get behind Moxley. And um, I didn't did I send you the picture. So Moxley had the um, showdown face to face with Punk at the end. 
Uh-huh. And someone on Twitter wrote, this is the most iconic uh, face-off since Rock and Hogan. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Sure is. Has the rating come in yet? Have we seen the rating? Can you just bring that up? I don't, they said it was number one on the night. But okay, well, that's I on thought, cable. I, mean, I want yeah. actual numbers. Uh, it won't be more than a million. If it is, I'll be surprised. It'll, re- it'll be the similar number what they have been getting. Let me check it real quick. I'm going to check this real quick. Uh, give me another uh, question while we're at it. Shakes yeah. put fun in functional wellness. Hello, wellness. Uh, Paul is joining us, everyone. Uh, he's just trying to work it out, so uh, bear with us. He will be on soon. I know you only tune in for him, not for me or Renee. <laughs> right. Um, Polly Mapping, thank you for the super chat. Uh, maybe Raw is better to review now that Try is boss. Shout out OSW Review. Try. Do you know what try means, Renee? Uh, okay, say that again. Right. So, probably my thing, uh, sent in super chat, maybe Raw is better to review. Now, if that try is the boss. Now, try is Triple H. So, oh, trips. No, try. Why Try. Try. Now, OSW. Try to pro- make your product better? <laughs> <laughs> no. So, there's a channel, OSW Review. They're great. They reviewed like every WWE pay per view from WrestleMania one onwards. Three Irish okay. guys, okay. hilarious. Now, when Triple H first came in, he was Hunter Hearst Hamsley, wasn't he? Yeah, uh, Connecticut Blue uh, Blue Blood. So when he started getting partnered up with Shawn Michaels, Shawn Michaels had a nickname for him. The first few weeks, he was like, "Try, tell him try," oh. and. It was that for a few weeks, and then eventually it turned into like Triple H. But <laughs> OSW was like, try, come on, try. And it's just like stuck for a lot of wrestling fans. So every time someone sees Triple H, it's come on, try. <laughs> so just, I just saw it 972,000 viewers for AVW. So nothing's changed. That's what they usually get, right? Yeah, pretty much. So, um, like I said, it's just hard to for the wrestling business to grow and I remember when AW was on the same night as NXT mm. and it was always fighting for that 1.4 and it would be like one show would have 800,000 the other would have 600,000 and when the decision came to move NXT to another night I think a lot of people I don't know why they fought it they fought the 600,000 in fact they fat NXT would get would all of a sudden start watching AEW, and they're not. I think they gained maybe a hundred thousand from it. And for the younger people watching this right now, they're talking about eight hundred thousand, six hundred thousand. Back in the Attitude Era with WCW and Raw, they were talking about three, four, five million each fighting over it. Each show was getting that. You had six to ten million people a week every Monday watching wrestling just in the United States. Right. I'm going to message Paul again because he's having trouble. I'll give you this super chat, Renee. This is uh, some Noah conversation. Uh, Pokemon trainer is giving you oh. some results. Um, oh. I'll, let you, I'll let you read them as I message Paul. Okay. So Kenyo over my partner. I'm assuming he means Dr. Wagner Jr. Well, Kenyo is the uh, GHC heavyweight champion. So Tanaka beat Green. Oh, that must be that Anthony Green fella. He... Uh, him and uh, the other guy. No, the other guy went home, but the Anthony Green stayed till September. Jack Morris over Kiyoma. Oh, wow. Who's this Jack Morris guy? Do you know who he is? I have no nope. But if you beat Kiyoma, uh, uh, it's Kaito. So, wow. Okay. And Kojima over Segura. And uh, Fujita over Shiozaki. Wow. Oh, that's cool. Are you missing Japan yet, or are you happy to be back? Oh, uh, I'm happy to be right where I'm at with you right now and all my 10,000.1 subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> well, in general, we love every single one of you that tunes in, believe yeah. me. We are nothing without you. Um, great uh, super chat for here from In Your Head Change Man. Thank you for the 10 euros, my European brothers. Uh, do you support any soccer teams? Have you heard of Aston Villa? 
I'll let Renee. I support, I support whoever Ronaldo plays for because one time he did the French tickler after a field goal. Right. So Ronaldo, plus his name's Ronaldo, sounds like Renee. He's over with me. Isn't he like the highest paid athlete in the world? I don't know about highest, but he's up there, especially for football. Right. Yeah, it's him, between him and Messi and Mbappé and Neymar. Um, as for me, I've heard of Aston Villa because I'm a Liverpool fan. Your man, I presume you're a Villa supporter, obviously. Steven Gerrard, you know he's a hero of mine. Uh, I'm a Liverpool fan, so the enemy of Man United, but don't even look at Man United's rivals anymore. I think City's our rivals now. And I'm not saying that as a modern fan. I've been watching and sporting Liverpool since I've been free. Um, Man United to just they look worse than what it was last year, which is great because growing up in the 90s, all it was was Man United was winning. So the fact that they keep losing, it's awesome for me. Um, We've got another one here from uh, Drew Stevens. Uh, thank you for the $10. Uh, no question. I'm sorry about what happened to your son, James. Um, thank you, Drew. Uh, thankfully, he's made a full recovery. And uh, thank you to everyone that sent messages. It really means a lot to me. And um, thank you, Renee, for committing to these podcasts. And thank you, Paul, for joining on to the podcast whenever you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul is in LA, so now he's being fashionably late. He's trying. He's probably watching us now. Um, he's trying. I've sent him another link um, saying his video's not working, so hopefully he sorts out soon. He is trying to join now, but we'll do our best. We, will, we won't We will leave until he comes on. We'll keep right. going. I'm not working tomorrow. I've took the whole week off work, obviously, to look after the little ones. So, um, and i got to go on to work thing. tomorrow, but, you know. Oh, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. whatever. You're driving or you're flying? I'm fucking driving, and I'm thankful. Thank God. I don't want to see an airport or an airplane until next weekend when I go to the airport. Question here, Artie Machine. Uh, Jericho's stable reminds me of the NWO, like they have the same storyline. Are, are you aware of the members in East Stable? No. Um, What's it called? What's it called? The Jericho Appreciation Society. Oh, of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't mind the stable. Uh, my kid brother watches AW and he loves it. Uh, and he's a big fan of, um, I don't know the name of the guy. Not Danny Garcia, but it's the tag team. But there's the one guy. He kind of looks like a South Park character. I think he calls himself the Magic Man or something like that. Um no idea what his name is, um, but um, he's pretty funny. And they've got Jack Swagger in the background. And when I say that, I mean that literally. They have Jack Swagger in the background. He does fuck all else. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but no, um, did you catch, I don't know if this was a rib, or I don't know if he was saying this, but as he was entering the ring, he was calling himself the last survivor of the Heart Dungeon. Oh, Jericho? Yeah, and he talked about training under, under Stu, and I'm like, "But you didn't, you didn't, Chris. No, you didn't. Yeah. I don't think you were trained at the dungeon. No, I think they trained. One of the Hart brothers opened up one of their many, many camps. And, uh, I think it was Keith. I might be wrong. Right, and then the story. I think I heard Lance Storm say the story that like they might have showed up one or two days and never showed up again. Yeah. That's the guy I like to get on here, Lance Storm. I haven't talked to him in years. Yeah. Yeah. People, please tag him. Um, someone actually mentioned on Twitter, and I did tag Lance. Uh, I think I tagged him. I said, I'd love to have Lance on the show. Uh, yeah. and he's a, I loved him in WCW. Do you remember when he had that gimmick when he was carrying three belts and he renamed him? Didn't he rename the US title, the Canadian title? And the, yeah. uh, was it the Cruiserweight, the. 114 pounds, 185 pounds lighter, and the hardcore title was the Saskatchewan title, something like that. <laughs> yeah, probably it's all a rib. They're pretty that hardcore would... in Saskatchewan. But uh, we got another super chat. Who, who was your favorite WWE diva when you were there and maybe work with? Um, well, I tagged with Don Maria a bunch, she was always fun. And then I wrestled Tori Wilson. That was always, you know, fun. <laughs> and then uh, I used to hang out with uh, the French girl a lot. And she was always fun to hang out with. So toss up between those three, I guess. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I'm just going to message Paul again on there. I'll try him on Instagram. Um, who was some of the Davis you didn't like working, if you can say? Uh, Shelly Martinez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't really care for Stacey Keebler much just because she was more of a performer, not a wrestler. You know what I mean? She was just a character on the show that she was eye candy, you know? So I like the girls that actually got in there and done it. I guess technically Tori was too, but I just, I don't know. Tori just had a sweetness to her, you know, a Midwestern wholesomeness to her that I liked. I think all the guys liked. And James, you froze. Sorry. Um, we got everybody asking us questions here. And you're, where's Paul? Sorry. I'm trying to uh, get Paul sorted out. Um, yep. Artie Machine, you, uh, you guys should watch um, AFL, uh, Australian Football Rules. So speaking of Australia, I have a good friend of mine named Slex. He's a really badass uh, Australian wrestler. And we're thinking about tagging and doing a tour of Australia. This will be my winter, but Australian summer. I don't know if it's going to come to pass, but I'd love to go back down under because Australia is an awesome country. And if I'm down there, I'll probably have a lot of free time to catch uh, Australian football. I think Sly's going oi, there. Oi, oi. Huh? I think Sly's going there. Sly is going to Australia? I think so. I'm sure I saw Sly mentioned on Instagram. For what? To wrestle? I presume so. Well, with Rob, probably, right? I don't know about Rob. I'm sure I saw it Sly, unless some. I'm pretty sure it was Sly who uh, posted like some show down there. I might be wrong, but I'm sure it was Sly. I didn't hear anything. Right. Okay. Any more super um, chats? My good friend Nick at Universal Wrestling Podcast. Uh, everyone, please check out his podcast. Uh, Renee, what are your thoughts on Will Osprey? Incredible athlete. I'd love to get in there with him someday, but unfortunately he's with New Japan and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, that's a guy I'd like to uh, I'd like to toss it up with someday. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Wesley Mahan, uh, what did you think to uh, rest Ric Flair's last match? He said he passed out twice. Did you watch it? Yeah. Uh, no. I just saw like I saw his entrance. He looked really old. And uh, from what I hear, it was... I'll probably watch... I'm usually like three months behind on everything. Like if something comes out, I'll see it three months later. But how old is he? 73? Probably. Well, it's Hulk Hogan's birthday today and he's 69. I think Flair's older. Yeah, I think he's in his early to mid 70s. So... <clears throat> Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, but he was back down in Puerto Rico, managing his uh, his son-in-law, and he got physical with Carlos Colon. So maybe he's trying to do like one last world tour. You know, Renee? that's the thing about wrestling, man. It's like musicians, right? I've got good news. Oh, oh, oh my God! <laughs> he is here. Oh man! And your teeth look extra white today. Yeah. That's uh, that's magic, I guess. I don't know. Magic of that's the only thing that looks good on this goddamn camera. <laughs> Still good to see you, Paul. Thank you for joining us. Only an hour and a half late, but that's okay. Yeah, no sweat. I mean, I can only get so motivated when I'm, you know, thinking about what what things might be discussed. Uh, <laughs> we need to start telling Paul who I guess uh, that will motivate him because. We tried to cave a poll. It's not working. We're just going to try yeah. to make them. Okay. We got I, uh, on the secret. I just don't we want Johnny G to G Yeah, we got Is Johnny he, Did I miss him? I missed him, though, huh? Yeah. That's okay. I mean, it's not okay. I haven't seen – I like Johnny a lot, and I um, I was more motivated to jump on just because I wanted to hear his Arnold impression. Uh, oh, yeah. He's one of the best he impressionists is. for Arnold. Um yes. You know, everyone thinks they have a good Arnold impression, but most of them, you you kind of just humor the person because you don't want to embarrass them. And uh, But his is legit 
good down to the facials and everything. I don't even know where the fuck I'm looking. Here we go. Um, <laughs> seriously, you would think I have like googly eyes or something. Like, ooh, where, okay, you know. guys, since we're an hour and a half in, I have to go urinate. Now, last time That's I why I this- checked in, so you could take right. your bathroom break. <laughs> last I'm time used I was to it. When I left last time during our last, the, the, the people in the interview or in the chat room said that I was off using drugs. No, I have to piss. Yeah, I saw okay. that. <laughs> off using drugs. Yes, Jesus. I drink coffee and water and by the ton of, so I got to go piss. I'll be right back. <laughs> Don't let them jump to conclusions. Yeah. Does it look like I'm looking at you when I look here? Okay. Yeah. Because like when I look my, at, yeah, like when I look into my toe, <laughs> I hope so. I, you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah. It's just when I look at you on the screen, I think the viewer, you know, it looks like I'm looking at someone off camera. <laughs> it it, it kind of looks like for I am because my camera. So my camera is just a little bit here. Yeah, so I am looking I'm, over at you. I'm looking you're next. That way. You're secretly next to me. I'm just. I have a massive head, apparently. So I watched, I watched that the other night, Paul. Where uh, you mentioned you as friends of the director, uh, Prey, the new Predator movie. Yeah, Dan Trachtenberg. Uh, I mean, I, I talked to him briefly last year, or it might have been the year. No, it was last year at some point. I guess they had already probably shot it, but. Either way, yeah, go ahead. A pleasant, not a great, not like you. You got like the media saying it's a masterpiece. It's not, but it was a pleasant surprise because the last Predator movie was fucking shit. Oh, it was dreadful. I'm a big, massive Predator fan, so um, yeah, that last one was really bad. There's the one scene, guys. If uh, please, if you're a Predator fan, I would imagine you are. You will agree with me. So. He gets the uh, predator tech at the beginning of the movie, pretty much the main hero, and he sends some of it into his PO box and whatever, like the uh, helmet and I think the wristband. So, yeah, because you can ship signed like buy yeah. huge weapons and stuff, helmets. Yeah. Well, well th- this is the part, right? <laughs> and I know we we can't take movies too seriously, and we have to suspend, you know, our belief, but. He sat at the bar. Now, he knows these secret agents and shit's coming to the bar. Now, to explain why the Predators can turn invisible, they've got, like, this little mechanism, this little ball, okay? It's never been mentioned before in a Predator movie, but in this one. So, instead of using the ball to turn himself invisible to get away from the Secret Service or whoever's coming, he swallows it. So Are you not able to manipulate... Your what's inside you, your organs to use use them at will. Yeah. I mean, I, who can't who can't do that? Walk and get away. <laughs> but, uh, oh god! If that, that if that if that's your gripe of that movie, oh, that's this one of many. That's one I was about to many. say. I mean, that's a good one, but there are endless. Um, yeah, that that I would even rank. That one worse than Alien vs Predator Requiem, which well, to be fair, looks as Requiem, dark as your surroundings you right now. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it. You're in the set right now, just how yeah. dark it is. Oh, I'm in my gazebo. So, okay, of darkness, Paul. Yes. Now I'm Are looking you? over to the le- <laughs> to my right. It looks like I'm looking at you oh, yesterday. <laughs> So, uh, Jameson here uh, <laughs> told me that <clears throat> Jameson, Jameson yeah. has, uh, yeah, that apparently a five time, five time, five time former world champion of an organization that hasn't existed in over 20 years um, was calling us names. Darn. <laughs> was there a reasoning for it? Was it actually him or was it one of his black well, guys? Please elaborate. Yeah, so I didn't know about this because I don't watch his show and go and buy his viewers. Not many people do um, <laughs> to say he's got 600,000 subscribers. Anyway, um, I noticed that in the chats who was waiting uh, before we went live, we used to talk about what Booker T said about you. So I'm like, I wasn't aware if I said anything about us. So 
He must have done a live stream yesterday. So I thought, all oh, right, I thought I'll check it out, see if he said anything. So do you remember when we had Kid Cash on and we spoke about Booker T's fight with Batista? Yeah. Yeah. I think it was mainly Kid Cash who was talking about it. And I think you just like said a few words about it, but I think it was mainly Kid Cash. I didn't witness it. I was just at the yeah. place where apparently it took place, but I didn't see it. And I well, mentioned I, that. I remember you saying that, yeah. And um so someone sent them a super chat saying um Kid Cash was on Paul London's podcast. So this is your podcast now. Uh, I guess, <laughs> yeah. I'm <laughs> super Paul, fashionably Paul late. <laughs> To my, that's, uh, yeah, um, you know. saying um, they spoke about um, your fight with Batista and it was over a chair and money that's all they said so they didn't exactly describe what we talked about exactly it was just like it was over a chair so Booker T was like um, his voice I've checked out their stuff what Renee and Paul what they talk about they get s- their facts wrong so even though even though he didn't say what the facts were wrong, what we what apparently you were wrong about, he just said you were wrong, and he said that they are what my brother would call fruity boot uh, fruity booties, <laughs> fruity booties, something like that. <laughs> well, that's a that's a compliment in today's <laughs> day. That's so a compliment. I checked, so I checked that in the Urban Dictionary on the internet. Apparently, uh, a fr- a fruity boo is someone that. Oh, you're Acts froze. Gay or F word. So the five times five times five time Hall of Famer is using the homophobic language. Wow. That's very 2022. So, so, okay, if there's members out there in the LGBTQ community, let us know what you think about fruit booties. Uh, fruit and booties. that is a term that is slander across, uh, you know, your people. Yep. So uh, <laughs> be a star of the WWE. But, yeah, um, new star. But Booker T, you say you keep it real, sucker. You said last time, <laughs> uh, and I don't give a fuck. And he, he's got a co-host that calls himself the boat. Do you want the, the boat? boat? Well, like motorboat? No, is he just? The, is he just the a be- big, big, the best big guy? The, be- the best of all time, allegedly. I don't know who this guy oh. is. <laughs> oh. So, Booker, you spoke about us last time. I messaged you. Booker, would love to have you on the show. Clear the air. We can talk about it. Your response, Booker. Yeah, dog, we keep it real on this show. Our DMs is always open. I DM'd you, Booker. I've got screenshots to prove that I DM'd you. You're more than welcome to come on the show, but you say you keep it real, Booker. Every wrestling podcast spoke about the Vince McMahon allegations. Because you're paid by the WWE dollar, you're the one podcast who didn't. Yeah. Oh, um, I believe that's I'm, called a burn. I believe James just issued a burn. <laughs> well, here's a burn. Here's a burn for you, Paul. Booker, at this moment, I've got on the TV. He's currently live streaming Oso. I don't know who now, that is. Is that a is that a bear? No, that's what we're doing right now. <laughs> that's what we're doing live streaming. No, Oso. I thought you said live. Oh, also, I misunderstood yeah, you. Also. Sorry. Now we've, we've just passed ten thousand subscribers. Thank you again, everyone who subscribed. We are over the moon to hit that before one year. That's we cool. Really Booker T got over six hundred thousand subscribers. Congratulations! That's a hell of achievement. It is. There is currently three hundred seventy-five people on our live stream. There is about 180 people on Booker T's live stream. Oh, mm. snap. Keeps it real, sucker. Now, yeah. Now, everyone, I spoke about this the other night, right? And if you think I'm getting too big for me boots, I probably am, right? But the thing I get pissed off with, with people like Booker T and all these big podcasts, mm. they, they tell their story. And because they are the big stars and unbelievable careers, I was a massive fan of Booker T. And I think he was an unreal wrestler. He injured a few people. He ended Rick Mardell's career, but that's neither there or there. But <laughs> you, but everyone's been so used to this narrative these big stars has been able to tell. These Booker T's, these Bruce Pritchards. And they told you a story from their side. Now, when there's a podcast who from Renee, Paul London, uh, Johnny Jeter, and even people whose voices you've never heard before, like a Chad Wicks or a Tank Toland, we've been able to give a platform to these people 
who's been shitted on for all these years, who's been made a mockery of. We've been able to give this platform for people. And now we're getting somewhere. We're starting to get a platform. We're developing a fan base. Because people stand to hear these stories, the real stories, the establishment, these big stars, it's rocking the boat for these, and they don't like it. So, Booker T, you great wrestler, great career, but as for a person, you're a bit of a bootlicker for WWE. And if you think what Renee and Paul's saying is wrong, then you tell the story. You tell us exactly what they're wrong, and we can listen. And if you want to keep it real, stuck <laughs> in, come and join us. Open invite. And Booker, Fruit Booty, 1991 call. They want their insults back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, it, it, it's very typical for, you know, people who call themselves boats and latch, latcherons and people like that. It's and, and just, you know, I think just a lot of marks in general, it's very typical for them to to want to stir things up and like, Hey, did you hear what so-and-so said? Thinking that if they somehow are perceived as having shared this information, that they'll be considered on the end, on the end with these, um, these wrestlers, these stars, whatever the hell you want to call them. So there's always people who want to stir shit up. And I, I mean, did I actually ever say anything negative about him? All I pointed out was that he never apologized for breaking my nose, which in hindsight just seems like something that one would do out of common courtesy and professionalism. So if you think I'm calling you out on your lack of professionalism, I guess that's what it is. Because, you know, for the position that I was in, Sure, if I could go back and do it differently, I would have called your ass out at the moment and this and that. But the times were different back then. And obviously the power structure was very different. So I guess it was kind of one of those eye-opening uh, experiences where you, 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 just, you, you become disappointed in people. And so if that hurts your feelings or hurt your feelings you know, sorry. Uh, it's just, that's all. I, I did not understand the gibberish that came out of your mouth when you sent me off the ropes and you met me way too close to the ropes with an elbow. Um, and it, and it caused an accident. Accidents happen. Sure. But I know that every single time I've ever had an accident happen that, that ended up being my fault. I was the first person there apologizing because I've never hurt anyone out of malice. And I'm not saying it was hurt out of, out of malice or done out of malice. It was clearly an accident. But all I pointed out was that there was no apology. So for that to hurt someone's feelings, it is what it is, I suppose, you know? So, but again, you're going to have, a lot of these marks or whatever that want to try and get on the inside and get on his good side, and, you know, I'll be in with them and blah, blah, whatever. Go ahead. Stir more shit, make shit up. If you want, I don't care. You know, <laughs> I mean, like I don't have the energy to put into that. It's <laughs> a weird comment. I'm just he stating said. it for what it was. A weird comment. He said, he's, um, he said, I don't know why to talk about. We talked about it cause we got sent in a super chat like what you were talking about, Booker. Well, don't know why they talk about it, because it's got nothing to do with them. I'm like, well, that's a fucking stupid excuse, because he's got nothing to do with AEW, but he talks about it every week. So it's the same fucking thing. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And we're, Speaking I guess, supposed AEW, to... Yeah, I was about to say, we're supposed to talk about it, but we we mostly don't. <laughs> Listen, I, dude, I watched. I'm the only one who watches it. Um, I watched the condensed version as I always do, and I watched about five minutes of it. And in the five minutes that I watched, you could have a whole episode of Botchamania. Really? Yeah, that's how. Oh, so I take it you didn't see it either. You watched six minutes more than I did. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, yeah um, I, I'm not. I'm not shitting on the guys. I'm not trying to, you know, bash them or anything. I'm just calling it like it is. Like I'm a wrestler, I watched it, and within five yeah. minutes of, of I seen enough botches 
to fill up a badge of memory for them. That's a shame. That's a shame. I, you know, I, I, you know, I would, I would hope that something would really strike a chord and be impressive and be something that really resonates and gets people actually talking. Like you get, you get that phrase thrown around so much. This person is going to be a game changer. And I think that's kind of the running joke yes. there is that every single person that gets acquired is a game changer. And they big, haven't big been with the game changer. <laughs> and I love big show, but I'm like, why? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so I, I, is the reason we're bothering with any of this just, I think, you know, cause you get a lot of people as well who are like, Oh my God, these guys are like so negative and blah, blah, blah. And whatever, like good luck with whatever you're doing. I don't really give a shit. Um, <laughs> we're obviously hoping that something will be really impressive and be like, Oh my God, that was really good. And I, I mean, I think, we do point out things that we do like and it's not, you know, if anyone thinks that this is all just for shitting on something, I mean, there's other shows that do that much better who actually watch the full thing as well and, and do that. So you might be better off listening to those shows. Uh, if Look at it this way for the go. fans. Look at, okay. Saying you yeah. go to a Metallica concert, you listen and they start playing Enter Sandman and they screw up three or four times during the song. Doesn't that take you out of it? Yeah. That's yeah, like, it should. Like me watching wrestling. If right. I see three or four screw ups in a match, it takes me out of it. Right? Yeah, and you want don't to. Do don't fucking do it. Unless you're, yeah, you're sure you can hit it. Don't try doing it. And where'd Paul go? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck's sake, Paul. Renee was hitting his stride as well. <laughs> Paul, please Where's come back. <laughs> Did you upset him? <laughs> He'll be back on the minute, I'm sure he will. Oh, I'm... S- no, I know what you mean, Renee. You go and see your favourite band and they fuck up the first lyrics or notes. It does take... And they've got some great talent, but I think the matches need producing better. I think, it's the, I think the producers are at fault more than talent. I don't know how much... I would imagine the talent has got their own say, but I think they could be better led if that's the right way. Right. So. Well, then I heard... I heard... I Since I started this podcast, I've been reading more of, like, the... the sh- some of these... Uh, there he is, Paul. <laughs> Did you miss me? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why, Paul? <laughs> I couldn't take it anymore. I thought, <laughs> oh... It was, it, was a good, it was a good Paul. run them three weeks. <laughs> Paul, you no, you're right. Eyes. You're on what? I'm... You got psycho eyes, man. You're scaring the shit out of me. <laughs> uh, he ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got like a bunch of super chests. We got to we gotta, we gotta answer these questions, dude. Yeah. Before right. we get to that real quick, I just want to say, if you, if you enjoy what you're watching, then I'm happy for you. I really am. And ultimately like, that's all, that's what matters. You know, not what, what we say, like we're not trying to sway anybody's opinions and think like, don't watch this show, you know, because you clearly will watch it or you won't. And that's fine. Like the wrestling business would be nothing without fans. And if you're a fan of what you're watching, then, then like, good, you know? I if mean, you're there's... Fan of this podcast, keep watching, keep asking questions. Uh, yeah, you know, we're, we're <laughs> simply giving opinions based off of experience. And if that hurts your feelings, there's other podcasts, especially ones in Houston that could use the viewers. So, you know, there's... There's other places you can go and check out and support. We're simply, you know, and I'm honest. I people think I I hate this repute. The people are like, oh, he's so negative, and this. It's like we're just giving opinions. Like fuck you, honestly. If that's something that really bothers you, then don't don't listen. It's not that hard. 
uh, and keep digging what you dig, you know, like Suck up. we keep, we keep laughing at what we think is funny. That's, that's what it is. And when we think things are good, we'll say it, you know, once we, if we actually watch it. So to on be, to the to super be, chats, I guess. Well, go to, ahead. To be, to be fair, it's okay. He hasn't threatened us with a lawsuit like other podcasts. So to be fair to him, oh, he hasn't done that yet. <laughs> Who I'm sorry, who talked off, off, miss- well, off camera? Off camera. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll mention it on camera, but then we'll actually talk about it off camera. Can't cool. Name names. Can't name okay. names. All right. Bunga Bunga, thank you for the uh, super chat. Uh this good great question for you, Renee, actually. Uh will there ever be a large televised pan European promotion? Yes or no? How would you promote it? Um I would like so, but here's the thing. It was coming close to fruition uh, in England, right? Yes. And, of course, WWE saw that as a threat, so they created NXT UK. And they signed all the guys that had potential that could go. And do we hear about them over here in North America? Hell no. I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you who any of those guys are. Unless you buy the network. They hardly get much, it hardly gets much promotion over here. I've started watching the last couple of weeks. Great talent, but I can't exactly say if they give it a lot of pro- promotion. That's it. So that was NXT UK was was created for the sole reason to hire all the quality talent because guys were starting to really make a living over there independently with all the work they had. And with the exposure they had over there, they were getting booked in America. They were getting booked mm-hmm. overseas. Uh, all over Europe, in Japan. And of course, WWE has to own everything. So in comes NXT UK. They handed out large contracts at first, a lot of money, more than these guys ever seen before. And then when they seen that everything was fucking dead, they cut their pay. Isn't it easier for a UK talent to go say to Canada and Australia because those are Commonwealth com- countries, and I don't know, does that play a, a matter in it? I mean, I've seen well, what I, I plays a matter in is the cost of flights and will the guy okay. draw? Sure, of course, that's a business, but just uh, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know about wrestlers, but uh, for tradesmen, for example, I know we, we still need to get like visas, okay? That figured, yeah, I just, yeah. um. I nearly went to Australia when I was um, 16, but me, um, because I'm a builder, and I went to college when I was 16, and um, I was offered an apprenticeship in Australia, and uh, it was a great job, and uh, especially for a 16-year-old, but my parents said, you're too young, and I'm like, ah, shit. Wow. That would have been pretty amazing, especially at 16. Australia is a great country. You should do one of these live streams with your builder hat on. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, that'd be hey, cool. Paul, I always want to know how your brother Christian Bale's doing. <laughs> he's speaking, he's Welsh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is he? Yeah, yeah, he's from from Wales. I thought he was Australian. No, he's from Wales. Um, Did I didn't. Oh, uh, I, I, I've gotten that in the past when I was a bit smoother in the face. <laughs> He was in the new Thor movie, actually. I heard he was one of the best parts of the new... I didn't see it, but I heard he was easily one of the best parts of the Thor movie. just wasn't in it enough. Um, but, I, yeah, I think he's he's certainly at the top of my list, um, along with, like, Sam Rockwell and, you know, Gary Oldman. I mean, incredible actors, but he's one of those ones that really commits to the, the body transformation for a character. Um, if anyone has seen The Machinist, you'll yeah. know what I'm talking about. I mean, that's you're you're risking permanent damage to your body just for the sake of playing a character, you know. And so, uh, absolutely incredible actor, um, insane. So, yeah, he's doing well. As far as I can tell, he's doing he's doing real well. <laughs> Just checking in. Next question. <laughs> right, I'm going to give you this super chat, and then I'm also going to go for a piss and not drugs. Um, <laughs> these are coffee. piss tests for anyone listening. Yeah. These are actually piss tests. Yes. Oh, yeah. We, we, so. we have to take piss, uh, piss tests to go on the building site. 
There you go. This is for this podcast. Renee, your ACW appearance, uh, ACW oh, debut appearance. Who came up with the? Who came up with the looking gear? Was it based what off Rick Martel and the model gimmick? No, it was based off. I didn't fucking feel like mm. wearing any more robes, and uh, <laughs> and the knee pads were a pain in the ass to always wash every night because I sweat profusely, and uh, it was all white, so nobody was wearing all white at the time. And I said, "Fuck it, I'm gonna go Lanny Poffo in 1985." Awesome. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. Well, that it was. Was that when you started? I mean, I remember your first few matches were with balls. I mean, they were using using you pretty heavily there, um, because well, we all know, did like that Hammerstein why, show. You know why the push got derailed, right? I I can only guess. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you why. Because Vince came up to me, patted me on the shoulder, and said, "Good things gonna happen for you, kid." And at that point in time, I was just miserable as a motherfucker, and I said, "Yeah, right," and I walked away. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh my god! And uh, yeah, I went duty from there. Yeah, I lost every match after that. Yeah. Jesus, yeah. I remember we did that Hammerstein show, that Hammerstein show in New York, and that was a lot of fun. But I remember oh, yeah. there was a there was a pay per view, um, <clears throat> like that weekend or the the week before or something. I can't remember which pay per view. And this is when Brian and I had the belts, and um, we weren't on the pay per view. I think it was it was like a SmackDown pay per view or something. Anyways, we weren't on the pay per view defending, right? Okay, nothing new. And he came up to us because they booked us for that ECW Hammerstein show. Okay. Against the Italians, and uh, he came up to us and he said, "Like, I know you guys weren't on the pay per view, but that's why I had you guys on this ECW show because." That show needs star power. <laughs> we just thought, like, right. You know, <laughs> got it. Star power. We will do our best, sir. And, like, it wasn't even a match that got televised on that, on that episode. I ended up getting that match from one of the crew people because it was actually a really, really good match. And we went in and everyone hated us because we were – Smackdown people, but then by the end of the match, we had won them over, and yeah. that was a really cool thing. Um, but yeah, star power, you, us, come on, star, star, power. star power, star power. That's right. Okay, next question. We got loads of questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, David K, thank you for the ten dollars super chat. Uh, thank you, David. Question, everyone. If you could have a mixed tag match with any diva, who would it be with, and who would it who would it be against? God, that's a tough question. Well, that's a good I one, David. Well, it is right. You two are in a mixed tag match. Who are your partners against each other? Oh, I'll be the ref. I don't know. I'll take that Jane Cargill man. She was fucking built like an Amazon, dude. Uh, okay. Or since I'm, I was the French gimmick, I'd probably take, you know, the French chick. Or I would go to Japan. I would take uh, Sudi Kondu. She's a stardom girl, just because mm. I've been a long time. Yeah. How about you, Paul? Mm. Um. Well, we have to pick a partner too, don't we? Is that? Oh, just a mixed tag, just any... Okay, it's, I don't know why I read it as like a six-person match. It's you, it's you with a partner versus me and a partner. Uh, God, that's that's a tough one. Um, Michelle McCool? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I always thought, you know, I always thought Molly Holly was really spectacular yeah. in the ring. Um... I always, you know, I, even like, I think it would be cool to do kind of a retro deal with like, um, Miss Moolah. Um, what was it? Brandy? Was it Richter? Brandy Richter? 
Oh, uh, Wendy. Wendy Richter. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think something classic like that would be pretty cool. Uh, even like, you know. Sherry? Sherry would be phenomenal. Yeah, that would be really sensational. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll take you and the Amazon on. We'll be glad to do it. Yep. Run circles around it. <laughs> uh, Bud, thank you for two dollars. Hey, Paul, I met you with Cena, Guerrero, and Mysterio. Hey, Bud. Uh, I'm I'm sure that happened. I believe you. <laughs> I wonder where that was. I'm trying to think of where that might have been. Um, but, yeah, Ray and Eddie were definitely... Um, and John was always very cool to the fans, but you have to, I mean, these are like mega stars. And so a lot of times getting to a building, they're going to have a lot more to do than I am. So I typically had more time to hang out and meet people and things of that nature. But yeah, everyone, everyone you named very, very good people. Very cool. It's a good group. So happy to be, uh, mentioned in that group of guys thanks bud oh. uh monster matt thank you again um paul you're so entertaining to listen to how didn't you get more mic time in wwe i'll never know could listen to you shoot for hours <laughs> thanks monster matt i like your uh your dog there very cute um i don't know if it goes back to like that handshake thing i had mentioned a long time ago i don't know what the deal was funny thing is when i first showed up uh and first appeared on smackdown before my mauling at the hands of brock lesnar uh i had a segment with vince and sable where i had walked in on them and i was like supposed to be from hartford because we were in hartford and I was just supposed to be like this eager beaver guy who was happy to be there. Like, like as if that was possible, right? This guy is just like, I'm from here. So like, can I have a match? Like, I'm going to come into your office and out of punishment. He threw me to the wolves. Uh, I guess threw me to the grizzly bear. Um, and you know, I got high marks for that segment. Like I didn't, I was into it. Anytime I had done a segment, um, that involved another person. I mean, I was an actor before I was a wrestler, keep in mind. And I've been acting most of my life. So listening and responding and reacting. And I, it's, I love to do it. It's, it's one of my absolute joys. So in terms of just cutting promos and things of that nature, I was, given one promo when they were trying to turn me heel at one point. And I think lasagna wrote it and it was just, it, it, he, they wanted me to be like really whiny and, and it, it was just weird. And I kind of mixed in some, some karate kidisms into that promo. And it, um, it was always more of a challenge to be written for because typically unless you were one of the very like top guys that they would just kind of give you bullet points anyone beneath that they really wanted you to kind of hit it word for word and we're not talking about award-winning writers here so you know it one of the toughest challenges as an actor and i'm not comparing acting to wrestling but in terms of bringing words to life it's clearly much more difficult to bring poorly written material to life and that's i mean it's a challenge and that's one of the that's one of the things that makes a lot of actors really spectacular um or they'll find a way to kind of say it in their own way uh i was still pretty fresh-faced at the time and so still kind of wide-eyed and there's all this pressure of just kind of like well if i mess this up then i'm not going to get another chance and this and this and this 
but then like fast forward a little bit and I had done a promo as El Gran Luchador before I took a beating from JBL. And um, I think I did most of that in Spanish and I was really happy with it. Uh, And, you know, it came off really good. And then I think fast forward or rewind, there was a promo I did after my first uh, cruiserweight title defense, just after WrestleMania 25, I was in, um, I think we were in San Diego and that's when I got busted open hard way, really bad with Kidman. Cause there was a bolt exposed behind the turnbuckle. And I just, I had to get 22 staples in my head. And so we we're going back and they're like, do you want to like, let's, let's go one of the younger writers. I can't remember. Let's cut a promo and stuff. Do you want to clean off first? I was like, no, like, let's do it like this. And I had blood all over my face and it was one of the more intense promos I've ever done. And for whatever reason, they ended up putting that just online for, I want to say a day and in black and white. And then they never touched on it again. They never went back to it. They never did anything with it. Um, So I don't, you know, your guess is as good as mine. I, I guess, you know, people like hearing some things I have to say and that's cool, but. um, That's what this podcast is for, Paul. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, but I think Renee was actually also a phenomenal promo. I think you were really, you no, really, just, you're just horrible. solid in your character. No, I, you know, you're very solid in your character, especially when you're doing like the, the, the Renee, you know, like the cafe stuff. It was just, I don't know. I just, especially anyone who just breaks out into like French and it's, they, they truly don't know a lot of times how to capitalize on so much talent that is there. And um, it's a shame, you know, it's a shame, but it is what it is. Right. Next one. Uh, Michael Burke. Thank you for super chat. Um, he's preferring a YouTube uh, link. Uh, Paul, this video is of you ripping on Matt Hardy's blog video. Still cracks me up 12 years God. later. Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know what it is. It was, it was like those are embarrassing times. I was doing all these YouTube videos, you know, and it was. I ended up taking them, having them taken all down, just because I, I didn't want to be portrayed in that kind of light, but I was still in kind of a recovery mode, I think from getting out of that environment. And it's always easy to kind of make fun of people that you don't like, especially when they're embarrassing themselves. Uh, so, but Hey, if people still enjoy it, that's cool. Yeah. I remember he was trying to threaten legal action or something. And I was like, that guy's just full of hot air, you know, nothing new. Just sensitive. He what? <laughs> These wrestlers are so sensitive. Just the the flag bearer, the flag bearer for backyarders everywhere. Right. Uh, in your head changed man. WWE made a Bret Hart. I think fid. Uh, WWE made a Bret Hart fid in, ter- in the vein of the self destruction of the Ultimate Warrior, but they never released it. Did you hear about this? I did. Oh, really? Uh, I didn't know remember, about that. Right. Do you remember the DVD documentary, The Self-Destruction of the Ultimate Warrior, where they just shitted on the Ultimate Warrior? Yeah. Was that before or after he passed away? Oh, this was before. way before. This was when they okay. were this. So this was like mid-2000s, I would say. Okay. Uh, you had like EBRC, Triple H, all these people. I mean, they shitted on the Warrior. So... So, yeah, this would have been, yeah, actually, that would have been about 04, 05. So, this was just before they started doing the, uh, when Bret Hart made his Hall of Fame, which was 2006, he was in the Hall of Fame. So, before they made an agreement with that, they was going to bring out a DVD called Screwed, the Bret Hart story. And I think, originally, it was going to be in a similar vein to this Ultimate Warrior documentary. But WWE and Bret Hart kind of made a piece because um, Bret had the stroke because uh, he fell off his bike. 
And Vince McMahon reached out to Brett and they kind of started talking. I think that kind of what brought them together. And he said, oh, and that, it was in Brett's book. And Brett had his main thing is protect his legacy because he's so proud of it. So because they agreed terms and became kind of like friends again, instead of screwed the Bret Hart story, it was Bret Hart, the best there is, the best of us, and the best ever there will be. It's a great fucking documentary. I recommend it to people. And um, that's what happened. Is it better than Wrestling with Shadows? Wrestling with Shadows is a great documentary. Yeah. Just the change of Bret. It's, it's available on YouTube, people, if you want to watch it. You, so when they first start recording him, he's happy and, you know, he's so proud of being WWE. Look at the difference at the start of the video and then the end of it, the difference in Brett. Yeah. I always felt that was one of the most powerful documentaries to come out easily. But I'm not familiar with this newer one. It's no. a, it's a, yeah, it's mid-2000s. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's the story. It was originally called Screwed. Well, then they patched things up and they changed everything. But it's a, it's amazing with that Ultimate Warrior one because, like I said, you've got these people shitting on Warrior. Then after Warrior made peace, they made a new DVD. You've got Triple H praising Warrior. He was one of the greatest. Because in the, in the original, he was like, I hated uh, Warrior squashing me within 12 seconds. He no-sold me pedigree. Then you got this new documentary 10 years later it was an honor to work with the Ultimate Warrior at WrestleMania. The hypocrisy. <laughs> the joys of being in control of a project and editing it to put yourself in whatever light you want to portray yourself as. Now, they still make money off of that character, don't they? Warrior, sure. yeah. Um, yeah, because he signed a Legends deal. and um... Bro, Guys, his wife is like head of creative, or she's like in the creative. Oh, she's part of it. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Really? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I had no idea. Well, then Very hopefully back. she's got a percentage of that, like a good percentage of that, because. Oh uh, yeah. Well, they've got the Warrior Award. They do have the Hall of Fame every year. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they've got an award for the Warrior. I think it's uh, for employees. Sometimes it's for um, other people, but it's mainly for employees, like what charitable things they've done. So like um, a Titus O'Neil's one, it was done. A, he was a great spokesman. Yeah. For yeah he's, absolutely. And, and they gave it to Shad Gaspard uh, this year because sadly, yeah. he and saved his son, another guy taken way too soon from us. Um, I remember speaking to JTG about that and that was so rough to talk about. That but, was um, brutal. Was, um, so, yeah, so next one. Thank you, champ. Uh, did WWE ever pitch uh, Renee Fee Silver on feud? Uh, we'll ask Renee that when he comes back. Or a Paul Fee Brian feud? Um, I'm surprised they didn't program you, Paul. You and Brian? Uh, you know, they, there's some stuff around that. I mean, yeah, when we got sent over to Raw, that was kind of the beginning of the end. Um, we went over on world's greatest tag team and, you know, I think we had had a couple singles, uh, victories here and there. And then we went into a, a program with, uh, Cade Murdoch. We went over on them for the raw tag titles in South Africa at the beginning of a tour and then dropped the belts at the end of that tour. Um, which was still one of my, one of my favorite tours, uh, but there was never talk office wise about Brian and I doing a feud because there's, I think there was, if I remember correctly, there was something where he walked out on me. I can't remember if it was with Umaga or whatever. And then next thing you knew, we were just teaming again. Like, I didn't have a problem with you. I would have done the same thing, pal. Like, I would have, hey, no, no sweat. Don't worry, I'm not mad. I mean, it's just, just ridiculous. But I remember in Europe one time, uh, Chris Benoit pulling us both aside one time. And he said, you know, you guys are phenomenal. You all have all the tools. But this feud between you two, that 
should and will happen someday, that is truly what's going to elevate you guys. And so he was always talking about it. I believe Sean even talked about it at one time, if I remember correctly, uh, to us. And, you know, so it was just one of those things that would have been a lot of fun. It would have been a really cool thing because we always had really good chemistry. Um, but, it, you know, <laughs> no. How about you, Renee? You and Sly ever, were there ever in talks? Are you guys having a feud together or against Never. each other? I should no, say? and it would have sucked. It would have sucked. <laughs> it would have been horrible. I, I, love, <laughs> I, I love how articulate Paul is, and Renee's like, no, it would have sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Straight to the point. <laughs> yeah. Well, Brian yeah. and I had like a, a beat the clock match that we were both really happy with. And see, the thing is, it was like, who can get a victory in the shortest amount of time? All right. And I think Kane or somebody had like the current record or so, like as we were doing our match. And it was like the winner of the beat the clock challenge gets a shot at the world title. So I remember Brian and I specifically going into the office and saying, look, like we're, we're friends. We're a team, you know, we're a unit. Have you want to look at it? How about we just like, right as the bell rings, one of us just lays down for the other and lets the other one yeah. beat them. And then like, we're guaranteed a world title, you know, and they're like, no, that's no, no, people would hate that. And then it's like, are you really? Because I think that would make a lot of sense. And that would, no, 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 people would hate that. Like, that's come on now. Like, they just shit all over it. And Triple H and so Sean done for the European title. <laughs> remember? Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I, I don't remember specifically, but I believe it, you know, but they, they can say whatever and it goes away or it goes that way. Uh, but in that match, we never, if I remember correctly, unless we did like, we did a couple forms, but we were actually, we were like refrained from striking each other. I remember that it was like really wrestling based and we refrained from striking each other. So we were trying to maintain some semblance of, some form of logic here, but that, that would have been, that would have been fun to do something along those lines. Cause it would have been fresh, but God forbid there's fresh material on that show. True. Steven <laughs> next guest needs to be Batista. We need answers. <laughs> I'd love that. I always liked Dave. He was always a class act to me. Always super cool guy to me. Um, my thoughts are that he's probably a little busy <laughs> to come on to our show, but we can always put feelers out there, right? <laughs> James on and Booker T. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> I got to get myself over, brother. <laughs> oh, big time. <laughs> I love you. Shoot, James. Oh, look at the praise James is right? getting. That's I'm right. Getting, I'm getting too much of an ego here now. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna turn into like an AEW hey, referee. This is where people get big egos. You're, you're seeing it transform right in your eyes. It's like an like an AEW referee. Oh. I want to say James managed Teddy Hurt. Thank you, Derek. So do I. Right, Paul. I think we. <laughs> Me we too. As long as he, as long as he shows up, makes your gear from hand, from scratch. And he wears so his sparkles and he has his cat. Yeah, you got to come to the ring carrying a cat, like Dr. Evil or something. <laughs> I can see he's seeing it in his eyes right now. I can see it. He's just kind of like, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Retro Neon, thank you for the five dollars. Uh, thank you. Retro sadly, Neon's awesome, by the way. That's great. Sh Logan. Check him out. Yeah. Oh, what is it? Is it a movie podcast by the sounds of it? Uh, I, I want to say there's some synth synth wave music, and yeah, just check them out. Right. All right, cool. Um, sadly, with WWE going more indie with Hunter's booking, do you think AEW should go the <laughs> WWE route with shorter matches, character development, and storylines, etc.? They should do that anyways. Yeah. 
I wish Jericho wouldn't change his gimmick every three weeks. He changes his name and his group every three weeks. Like clockwork. The man's had more gimmicks than Sylvan. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. Right? That's not, I mean, yeah, the slithering through the shark cage, guys. Is that what you're talking about? The everyone oh, went yeah, full. Dude, I, finally, I finally saw what you're talking about. <laughs> like, what the fuck was that? Oh, and those guys are from Montreal, too. Those are some French Canadian boys. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Game changers. Last, <laughs> last not by a fan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Paul, you're a natural at podcasting. Please do more. It'd be great if you turned up on time. Yeah, could you imagine? Uh, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate the compliments. I'm feeling a little low energy right now. Uh, it's extremely hot where I am at the moment. So, Paul, I'm on my 15 cup of coffee. God, I would, I would love to be in the Maritimes, sipping a 14th or 15th cup of coffee with you. That would be... You could come on tour with me, man. I got three shots uh, starting tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's a little late notice, um, but hopefully somewhere down the road we can get get mixing it up or at least teaming together. I would love to team with you. I think that would be so much fun. It's a lot less work. So much fun. Yeah, we'll just... And everything would make sense, and it would, yeah, that would be a real joy. So, let me, uh, any of you promoters know. out there who are listening, let me let me talk to some people. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Did you see the pictures I sent you? Uh, one of the fans uh, got WWE, to, uh, it was a uh, SmackDown Fee Raw, I think it was like 2007, and it paired you to your two characters up and called you Cafe de Rene. Oh, was that like for the video game, right? Yeah. I did see that. That was really cool. That was creative yeah. and fun. And I was in it had tip top shape. Gimmick, though. Does that mean you have to grow that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll just paint it on. Everyone wears face paint now, anyways. So we'll just yeah. paint it on. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Joseph Morrison, thank you for the five dollars. Um, thank you, I Joseph. A, I was a big fan of Muhammad Hassan, and think he really got a raw deal in WWE. What are your thoughts on him and the way he was treated? I think that gimmick had a shelf life to, right from the get-go. I mean, you can only go so far with it. Uh, he would have had a main event run, and he would have made enough money to last him a lifetime if it would have, you know, gone through. Uh, there was a lot of jealousy there from a lot of those people. Then I don't need to speak of, you know, sparky plugs and uh, – race car drivers and all that jazz, but um, yeah, I mean, just faith because he got a raw deal because that London bombing, man, he was on here talking about it. It was just, was he luck. really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We had him on here and it was, uh, they were actually in London and it's when the London bombings happened. Right. And they Jesus. aired the footage anyway. And then the network said, fuck this. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I get rid of the character and that's it. I mean, how how do you come back from that? How do you get repackaged from that? You can't. So in one way, it's a great gimmick to make a lot of money real quick, but long term, it was a shit for him. Now, what would have happened if he would have been put on camera, started doing the gimmick and just said like, hold on, no, and just broke character and then just like taking the thing off and just like literally had just broken character and introduced himself as Mark. Uh, what was it? What it Mag- was it Mark Kobani. Magnus? Okay. Was right. Kobani. Chobani. Yeah. Oh, Kobani. I thought it was Chobani. I was like, I'm the yogurt guy. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but how do you just said, this is like who I am and I can't, I can't allow myself to, to, to portray this right now. I can't allow myself to do this anymore. Like, you know, I had, like that, to me, that would have been super interesting, you know, um, similar to, 
was it one of the headbangers who had like a really silly gimmick and he just kind of was like this i can't i can't do this or something and he cleavage yeah, yeah, that's what it was, right? Beaver cleavage, one of those really genius ideas. Um, and he just broke character and was just like, this is... But I mean, I, obviously, I think they planned. I, but like to me, that was interesting, you know, because that was very different. So it's a shame. I liked Mark a lot. Uh, and I, I would hear grumblings from the vets, like the older vets and stuff like that, that you know, like, oh, he's blowing it, you know, like he, he's not, you know, he's got a million dollar gimmick and he's not living up to it and he's not uh, playing into it, you know, like outside the arenas and stuff like that. And so I guess like there is one complaint, like, I guess like, you know, there's devil's advocate to a lot of things, but that's something that you could always think like, you know, is he going to really incite all these people? Like, it's a way to draw heat, right? It's an automatic heat magnet. And he just, he, you know, I, I, it, it's hard It's hard to say that he was comfortable in that character full time, you know, like, because it's very much not him. No. You know, he's very, very hip, slick uh, guy who strikes me more as like, a Drake type guy than, you know, a chic or something like, I don't know. It was a, what was a big, uh, what if, um, probably my thing. Thank you for the 420. Um, Paul, what are some of your top, uh, pre nineties horror movies? Great question. I can wow. Remember. Yeah. <laughs> I was just looking at something and, you know, 1988 was like I was eight years old. I, that was a really solid time for horror. Like you had Child's Play, you had Hellraiser Two, Hellbound, you had Nightmare on Elm Street Four, which is one of my absolute favorites of the whole franchise. You had the Blob remake, which I thought was really cool with the young Kevin Dillon with a mullet, um, where they didn't, you know, they. The thing about the 80s horror films, um, there was a lot of body horror, which I was really into. Like, I think that's always something that's extremely effective. You know, like going back to like Cronenberg's uh, The Fly. And even like The Fly 2 gets shit on a lot, but I thought that was really good. But one of the films that I absolutely loved uh, that's pre 90s, that was also 1988, was Waxwork. I thought Waxwork was phenomenal and it doesn't get spoken about enough and sadly uh david warner passed away um i want to say just shortly like a week or two ago or something and that was pretty sad and i had going wrapping this back over to wales i had done a convention uh in wrexham is that how you say it yeah uh yeah in wales yeah yeah (laughs) I mean, yeah, and it was like the Wrexham com whale. It was the Wales Comic Con, and I remember I was added to this Comic Con kind of last minute through PCW out of Preston, and I remember uh, what's his name, the dancing dinosaur guy, Brodus Clay he was at this PCW show and I had never met him before, but he I initially didn't really get a good impression off of him because he just sat in his booth in the locker room with his headphones on and like, didn't talk to anybody, you know, like a big star. And it just like, it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. I was kind of like, fuck is this guy? Right. And he went out there and had a match and it was like so bad that the people were just chanting at him, like, to dance and like there was like another show the next day and the promoter was like uh don't worry about the match they just they just want you to dance and do your sort of stuff because like it was just it was bad but anyways he was promoted at this wales comic-con and i remember me and uh doug williams got put in this little hall area where almost like it almost seemed like we were the ones selling tickets to this comic-con like we were put off in this weird hall and back in the main hall, you had like Animal and 
uh, maybe Lance Storm and maybe Greg the Hammer, like some actual legends, you know. And then you had, and it had Burtis Clay, and I remember his poster said "Pro Wrestling Legend." I was just like, "Who the fuck made that?" Um, <laughs> I took pictures of it because I was like, "Nobody's gonna believe me." Uh, <laughs> and uh, but n- n- long story short. Walking by, I saw there was a table, and David Warner was at this table, but he wasn't. He wasn't there. It was like his table. So I was like, "Oh shit!" And they were like, "Oh, he just went to the bathroom. He'll be back." Blah, blah, blah. So I was looking around, kind of, you know, this is. I was. We were away from our tables. Like we figured, like, okay, this is silly. And I saw him, and I ran up to him. I was like, "Oh my god!" You know, like it's so good to meet you. Like I'm a big fan, and I'm sure he was thinking I was going to mention. Count, any other film he had been in but i brought up waxwork and i was like as i was shaking his hand and he goes waxwork <laughs> and like flung my hand off as if it was like sewage on his hands or something i was just like god like well, why are you embarrassed about waxwork it was great so that was sad a sad real but then i later learned that he was Hired on for like maybe a day or two. They shot all his stuff in like a day or two because he was so expensive compared to the rest of the cast. But it had like Zach Galligan in it off of like Gremlins fame. It was yeah. just a fun movie, you know. Even the second one has like a Bruce Campbell cameo in there. I think uh, Drew Barrymore appears in Waxwork too, believe it or not, in a very small scene. Uh, and Anthony Hickox, who directed that, he also did the Warlock films, which I was a big fan of as well with Julian Sands. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about 80s horror, you know, from Street Trash to Night of the Demons to Spookies. I mean, Pumpkinhead. I just love I love 80s horror films. And um, it's tough to say that they'll ever be replicated They're They're often imitated. And I, I would like to think that horror films are shifting somewhat back to practical effects but not like they'll not like it was back then i don't think it'll ever you know because nobody's nobody's gonna say like well we have the money and the capabilities to do cgi but well you know what let's do practical which sadly you know when you think back to the thing carpenter's the thing so much of that most of that was in camera practical effects and uh I'm I'm trying to remember. Um, I'm embarrassed. The studio that did a lot of those effects um, was, you know, Tom Woodruff Jr. and um, Alex Gillis. Is that his name? I think. Uh, yeah. So they did all these practical effects to be used in the last thing that was done, which was supposed to be like a prequel, where it was a prequel. And they had made all these practical effects for the film. And then the studio was like, nah, no, nah, you know, we're going to just kind of CGI over all this crap. So the studio ended up using all those practical effects and they made a movie called Harbinger Down with Lance Henriksen, who Lance Henriksen is phenomenal, legend. right? It's just absolute legend. Yep. Uh, and he was in so many of those eighties classics. Um, and you know, and you have all the like Empire films, you know, like Ghoulies and Ghoulies Two and Troll, and you know, um, just so many classics uh, that I thought were terrifying as a kid. And there's they still have a lot of dolls, you know, they still have a ton of charm. So any of the films I've mentioned, I would highly recommend them because they're cool. just a lot of fun, and I haven't been I, I haven't even scratched the surface. I mean, there's just so many films from that era that were just absolute classics. So, thank definitely, you. Uh, and they say, you definitely got your money's worth out that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Renee's like, well, I'm going to take, like, four pisses and see what else I can do. Thank you. I thought I'm right. $100 Mexican. Is that right? Smiley. Oh yeah, yeah. I believe so. Yeah, hundred pesos. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Ha- have Renee or Paul or James met Scott Norton? I haven't. I tagged with Scott Norton in Japan. Cool. Oh, cool. 
Yeah. And, was uh, he? I mean, how was that? Um. Yeah, the match was whatever, but right. I'll tell you a drinking story with Scott Norton. So uh, we go to the Fridays in Rapunga. You know what I'm talking about, right? Paul yeah. Norton, right. We got right. there around 12 noon. <laughs> we start drinking beer at two o'clock, which, mind you, is like what four a.m. in Atlanta time, where he was living. Yeah, the right. phone rings and the manager says, "You got a phone call." Scott already knew who it was. It was his wife. She had tracked him down. How the fuck? This is two thousand seven. I don't know wow. how she did it, but she found him. Anyway, we kept drinking. <laughs> I tapped out at five o'clock. Okay, so that was five straight hours of drinking beer. I couldn't take no more. <laughs> I I go back to the hotel, which is in Rapungi. It's the Ibis Hotel, right? It's yeah, really, Ibis. Right. Eleven o'clock at night. I he just just kicks down my door. I don't know how the fuck he got a key or how he got in, but and he's wired. He's ready to go. So this man mm -hmm. was drinking for eleven straight hours. <laughs> And he's he a huge, a, he's a big guy too. He's a very large man, yes. So that, that man can drink. And, and he wanted uh, to go back out and drink some more at 11? Well, he, no, I don't know how, where he got his energy. Like, this is 11 straight hours of drinking straight beer. Holy shit. He, he was, he was just fucking ready to go. So yeah, that man can go. Jesus. Yes. Yeah. We, I mean, I've only, I think I've only met him once. I want to say it was at a convention or something. It wasn't in a working sense, but huge guy. Just, you know. Got a big head. Really, yeah, really impressive. Yeah. We used to always say he had like one of the, he was one of those like old school guys that had like that muscle gut, you know, yes. where it was like. Barrel chest. Power yeah, lifting, just Well, he super was an arm wrestling lifting. champion, right? He was legit arm wrestling champion. He was in the movie Over the Top. Yeah. Was he really? Yeah. I think I just watched that again recently. Another one of my absolute favorites. Mm. I believe it. Yeah, I think you're, yeah. He was a bodyguard for Prince. I mean, he had a really fucking cool life. Jesus. Uh, just yeah. get him on the air. Yeah. Cool. Always a fan of that guy. All right. Um, the Angle Podcast, thank you for the $5. Hey, James, Renee, and Paul, love what you do, guys. Uh, love what love what you guys are doing with the show. My apologies. What are you most optimistic about in terms of the future of pro wrestling? There is um, no future. It's all going to end. It's fucking dead. <laughs> We're all gonna die. You sound like Sarah Connor on T two. Yeah. <laughs> We're all going to die. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually excited about Triple H taking over. I reckon it's going to improve. I don't know if I'm just being optimistic, but I think it's going to improve under Triple H, personally, especially bringing back uh, Karrion Cross. That's, uh, for me, that definitely, that's a thumbs up from me. And they brought back uh, Dexter Loomis, too, right? Who yeah. I'm a fan of. Yeah, I'm a fan of both those guys. Cross a really good friend of mine, and that was, um, and, you know, they had managed to keep that, Fairly kayfabe for the most part, hadn't they? I mean, nobody saw that. I mean, we were just we were talking about him off camera last week, trying to see yeah. if I could get him on here, but um, probably not going to happen now. Uh, so that is no, that is exciting, you know. To um, Terra Rising's credit, like that's very cool. Um, I I I think that is what wrestling needs to do more of is really find the right people to keep things under lock and key and add more surprises that genuinely create and generate intrigue because that's what's missing from a lot of the matches sadly is the art of kayfabe and people staying in character after the matches and you know i'm not saying people should be cutting promos on each other on social media but you know the the like we're performance artists and we went shopping together and like thanks for taking care of me and like thanks for, i love you like that shit's gotta go that shit's gotta fucking go and when that shit fucking ends and people start respecting the craft again and start 
maintaining that that sense of illusion um, and believing it themselves to the point where the fans believe it, then it'll really start to hopefully uh, get back to where people can be taken on these rides. Hopefully. I mean, fingers crossed. So that was a cool thing. I like, I like surprises, um, especially yeah. when they involve good people and good talents. So. Go. Uh, the champ. Thank you again for another $5 super chat. Thank you, champ. Uh, questions for both Renee and Paul. How long did it take for the SmackDown fist to get set up? Thoughts on the following. Or in Cena, Lesnar, Cornet. Oh, sorry. Or in Kennedy, Lesnar, Cornet, Cena. Jesus Christ, with a dollar for each fucking... <laughs> <laughs> Christ almighty. How long you know it how, take how long it takes Paul to answer a question? <laughs> We're gonna be I'll just... Morning. I'll treat it like word association. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll, okay, Orton, Paul, go. One word. One word answer. Uh, complete package. That's two words. Kennedy. The shits. Pass. Lesnar. <laughs> Absolute monster. Cornette. Very convincing for the business. Cornette. Uh, absolute character. True historian. Uh, gotta love how opinionated he is. Doesn't give a fuck. He Cena. does. <laughs> well, in certain things, <laughs> he doesn't give a <laughs> Cena... Uh, Probably, you know, the Mick Jagger of professional wrestling in terms of just work ethic. So. Okay. I mean, the guy had learned fucking Chinese, Mandarin, for business reasons. Like, I mean, that's that's pretty insane. Always at the gym. I mean, I don't know. Hey, Mick Jagger's a little. Anyways, I'm done. Okay. I'm <laughs> done. Let me go to sleep now. <laughs> but as it's nearly two o'clock. I'm just I don't know what I'm saying. Um, oh come on, you got you got you got a Scott Norton kick out. Uh, I've got a week. Off. I've took the week off work this week, so I can stay up to like five a.m. If you just want to go. Ooh, <laughs> um, let's the, do it. the benefits of being self employed. <laughs> um. Sup, uh, sorry, thank you, PK1. Uh, Sup, Renee. Hey, Paul. Do you remember when Hoovy Tude Guerrero done a You guys thing? didn't answer that last question the, with the names. I love them all. I love them all. They're going to, they're all invited to my oh, you Fucking kiss ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sup, Paul. Sup, Renee. Hey, Paul. Do you remember when Hoovy Tude done a 450, which led to your nose break? Was it just unlucky or bad timing? Did you break? I don't remember. I. I don't remember the 450. I remember the 405 oh. uh, or the 408 or whatever. It wasn't actually a full rotation. Did yeah, he go? did. No, he did like a. It may not even have been a 400 because he did like a. He stood up and he did a flip like a 390. Um, his foot landed on my orbital. I did like a front flip, like shin, foot, shin, knee to my face. I remember that specifically because it was in Wooster, Mass. And um, I had driven into the, sh to the building with Davari. I think we had come in from Baston or something. And we went through a toll road or a toll booth at the night before, I want to say at like one thirty or two in the morning, getting to Wooster, and neither of us had any fucking change. And Devari tried to pay for like this dollar fifty toll with like a hundred dollar bill, and the guy was so mad, um, just furious that he was just like, "Get the fuck out of here!" And so we drove off. I don't. Know, it was really funny. So we then we get to Wooster, Mass. And I get to work Hooventude because I was kind of married to him at the time. And he does that fucking 390. And uh, yeah, stepped right on my orbital. They didn't, it didn't knock me out, but it, it was one of those things that just stuns you. But 
to my surprise, the office was concerned and they had sent out like Dr. Rios and they sent out maybe the other trainer, Larry or whatever. And, um, and they ordered me to go get a CAT scan that night. So poor Devari was like stuck with me till, well, he was stuck with me, but yeah, I had to go to the, get the CAT scan and all that. We didn't get out of the hospital until probably like close to three thirty, four in the morning. And then we had to fucking drive more. And it was, that was a long night. So fun times. Fun times. <laughs> uh, hold on. The guy wanted to know about the fist, how long it took up the fist. Oh. The, the crew would get there around 8 o'clock in the morning, and by 2 to 3 o'clock, everything was set up. So wow. that the this, this fist in particular, I don't know how long it would take, but the whole thing was set up within, I'd say, five to six hours. Yeah. Yeah. Michael Hayes would bend over, and it would take about two or three hours to just pull that out. Um, cause that's where they stored it. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we've had that comment a few times tonight. Uh, someone said to Johnny G, looking good, Johnny, looking real good. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he had some stories. He was certainly in the demographic. Oh, we'll, we'll definitely bring him back. Uh, definitely. And we'll I'm make sure I him missed him. <laughs> uh, this question I want to know about as well, Paul. Uh, thank you, Josh Coffey again. Uh, Paul, can you talk about the Superman Returns audition experience? My guess it is for Alex Luthor for Grow. Did you have any weird feelings about Singer? It was not for Alex Luthor Thug. It was for Superman, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, it was for Superman. Uh, I was in Texas at the time, and I got called up to audition in Dallas because they were literally blanketing the country. Uh, trying to find the next Superman. I mean, we're talking about, you know, the first film, you know, version of Superman after Christopher Reeve, you know, who, in my opinion, is still just absolutely phenomenal. I think Henry Cavill's great. And I think yeah. he's the closest thing since Christopher Reeve, but, you know, either which way. Um, so we read scenes from the Richard Donner Superman, the original Superman, because they obviously they didn't want any of the script leaked or anything. So the audition was, you know, you did a couple scenes as Superman and then you did a couple scenes as Clark. Uh, so they could kind of see that, that duality. Uh, but I got really high. It was one of the, one of those auditions where you, you sadly, <laughs> you sadly get your hopes up because the feedback was so good. Um, but to my detriment, I was not over six feet, which was one of the things that ended up becoming like a real hard requirement, which makes sense. You know, he's the man of steel. Um, so that was, that was a real heartbreaker. Uh, but I thought, you know, I thought Brandon Routh did a really solid job for what it was. I don't think it's one of the most praised Superman films out there. And um, in terms of Brian Singer, uh, you know, I think anybody who's got access to the Internet can look him up and see the things that he's been involved in outside of films and draw their own conclusions. But um, I didn't know any of those things at the time. So had I been over six feet and things would have worked out, obviously I wouldn't have said no. Yeah. Um, but, you know, looking back on it now, who's to say, you know, uh, the guy's made a ton of money with his films. Um you know, but he's done a lot of a lot of questionable things um, outside of that. So there's a documentary out um, on the Internet called uh, An Open Secret, which delves into a lot of the sexual harassment and uh, towards minors and stuff in Hollywood. And it's very disturbing. 
So if that's something you guys are interested in checking out. Yeah. Uh, I'm into yeah. a lot of that stuff. I think it's, you know, and like the girl from, is it iCarly or something like she had just put out her book recently. Oh, yeah. She was in Drake and Josh, wasn't she? Was the, was no, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's the same girl, but she put out her book, which I think it was like, I'm glad my mother's dead or something, but she talks about her whole experience in Nickelodeon right. and how they tried to pay her off with like 300,000 to like never speak about her experience in Nickelodeon because, oh. um, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's, uh, I don't envy adolescent, che- like teenage child actors i mean the i mean you just you, you'll go down a rabbit hole trying to look at all this stuff you know um clown house that was another 80s horror film that i was a huge yeah. fan of which yeah. is the first time i ever saw I know, sam rockwell were... and i love you know like sam rockwell is my favorite actor and that was the first time i'd ever seen him and that film is I mean, it's it's hard to watch just because that director, you know, Victor Salva, who created the Jeepers Creepers yeah. franchise, uh, convicted pedophile, you know, and it, that shit's that's just just fucking scary, you know. So, um, yeah. And you wonder why a lot of these child actors end up ends up fucked up later on in life. Yeah, um, Odine, uh, just going crazy. It, it's sad. It's really sad. Um, you know, there was a mansion, or there is a mansion uh, in Encino that Suge Knight used to own back during the death the death row years, and after he owned it, I want to say is when. Um, a known, you know, a, a known pedophile ended up buying it. He ended up starting this network called Digital Entertainment Network, Den, and they ended up having a ton of young boy parties at this mansion. And I mean, it's just, yeah, if you watch, yeah, an open secret, absolutely chilling documentary. Um, you're going to go down some rabbit holes. It's, it's pretty scary stuff. So, but yeah, Brian Singer was a part of that group. Uh, we, um, me and Renee, we spoke to Dawn Marie a couple of weeks ago and she's yeah. our next interview coming out Monday. And, uh, she, she would have been young, probably late teens, early twenties. And, uh, she spoke, didn't she, Renee, when she was at stop at like a, was it a producer's house or something, a director or a talent agent. And, she was lucky to get away let's put it that way yeah that's that's a really good interview man that was some crazy stories she told crazy. and i think you know stuff like that sadly has gone on in the wrestling business um over the you know over the course of its history um whether it's kind of like these Southern promoters. Um, I mean, fortunately, it's nothing that I ever dealt with, uh, but you always heard grumblings or stories about this promoter, you know, and this per- It's 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 scary stuff. It's sad. And a lot of it, I you know, obviously a ton of stuff came to a head with like the uh, speaking out movement a couple years ago. Which well, you you were a part of one of the Ring of Honor, right? And its owners back yeah. in the day, which was yeah, I was there when that when we when that whole thing kind of came about. It was like a almost a to catch a predator type thing that occurred, um, and that was <laughs> you know it's fucked up. It's fucked up shit, you know. Uh, so let's finish these super chats and I got to start packing my gear bag. Yep. How far do you got to go tomorrow? Uh, if it's farther than my front yard, it's too far, Paul. But so you have a, you have, you're a front yarder now. Nice. Yeah. 
No, it's about a four hour ride, so I gotta leave around noon. Oh, wow, that's <laughs> nothing. That's fine. Um, Bebel, thank you. Any Sean O'Hare stories? Sean O'Hare. Sean O'Hare had one of the most beautiful wives that I've ever seen in my life when we're living in Kentucky. She was like supermodel playboy of the year type <laughs> looks. Uh, then he, I think, got a divorce for her. And then he was always around super beautiful women. Uh, and then I heard rumors that his sexuality was questionable. I heard a Kevin Seven podcast. You know, remember him, Fertig? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lasagna. So, that was the guy Lasagna told to make out with him. Or his, yes. Nick's, Nick's his Undertaker feud, right? Right. He kind of actually hinted to the fact that Sean might have been, uh, you know. A Booker T insult? Right. Sure, yeah. I don't know what I'm allowed to say these days if he's going to be insulting, but that, like, that's what he had. I never seen that. I always seen him around like super, super beautiful women. But isn't that sad though? At the end of the day, when you know, not to get like overly political or into this, like, but that at the end of the day, like you know, and it goes back to like the history of the business, but it just it it created just this this manly atmosphere that you know you you look back and you wonder just how many guys just could not come out or be themselves out of fear of retribution, whether it's like losing work, never getting booked again, getting beat up, just all this shit. And it, it's sad. You know, it makes you wonder how much they could have excelled if that had come at a time when, you know, they felt that that was acceptable. Right. You know, because um, I thought Sean was phenomenal. I thought he was just a freak athlete. He was always super cool to me. He was one of my he he and A Train were my first series of matches on the road when I first got up on the road. Brian and I were working A Train and Sean O'Hare uh, in tags for quite a bit, and he was just always so cool and you know very helpful and. I always had a real joy working with them and it was, it was sad, you know, like to, you know, as is most, most, uh, endings to a lot of these guys, uh, that pass away way too young, you know, it, you would have always hoped that he would have broken through to that next level, especially with like the whole devil's advocate gimmick that he was that doing was really ended cool. up. Yeah, that, that was, was really awesome. Cool. That was yeah. so fresh and it was just really cool. Um, and I, what, I was the story. Vince just like didn't understand it or didn't get it or something. like <clears throat> I don't know. Well, he had, he had uh, he had demons too. We all do. Yeah, no, no, but I mean, like with substances, abuse and stuff. And once that gets, once the the office gets wind of that, then you become a liability. Then you become hard to trust, right? So, can you say that for most of us, though, in a lot in one way or another? At that point in time, there was no more competition, right? It was the only game in town. Yeah, I think Vince was really high on building his company as high as it could go, especially since it had gone public, right? It was publicly traded and stuff. So, sure, wheels were in motion to really, you know, right. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, why did Frankie Kazarian have such a short time in WWE? I heard I'll it because he one. didn't want to cut his hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah I was his. Him. I was his last match. Frankie's the only WWE talent that I know of that came in and left undefeated <laughs> <laughs> for that cup of coffee that he was there. He walked into Starbucks, drank his coffee, and left undefeated. Um, and I was that was his last match. I was literally there in Gorilla when they were telling him to cut his hair, and he's just what? Like it was shocking to him, right? 
the the funny thing of all that is that did you remember what he did after that after he left the company cut his hair he went to tna and cut his hair <laughs> uh yeah uh jared aviat thank you for the 15 dollars uh hi wow, again thank you, jared. i was curious on your thoughts on the infamous he who shall not be named slash later slash edge drama in wwe in 2005 what did renee and paul think of this edge and lita got nuclear heat out of it thank you i mean i'll just say you know the bow-legged guy like we had heard i was at that show i want to say it was in south carolina when edge's uh corvette or rented sports car or whatever ended up getting like a brick put through it or something uh in the parking lot i is slushed their tires slashed it was something they vandalized his car somebody did and um it was obvious who was behind that uh that dude's really possessive with his with the the, the women that he thinks he owns. Do you remember so. he had the channel? So this is early YouTube. I don't even think it was on YouTube. And he had like this life size cardboard cutout of Lita, and he put it on, and he ran over it with a truck and started go, going back and forth on it in his car or something. Do you remember that? That tells you everything you need to know. I think, and I, 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 I think even I remember a few years later, he was dating this other chick, and uh, and I think this was when he left WWE. I might be wrong, but it said, "How do you like my new leader?" I'm like, was that when he was like walking out into the forest with guns and trench Probably. coats and stuff? Okay. You, you got anything? Face. You could see the look on Renee's face. He was he was so interested and involved in this. I didn't ankle. give a flying fiddler. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll give you yeah. You've been great tonight. Uh, thank you for another eight dollars. Um, thank you, Brett, Brett. Talking about Eric Bischoff and WCW is funny on his Inside the Ropes uh, YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, I've never met a bigger idiot in all my life. I mean, he was an idiot. He didn't know nothing. Is that what he said? Oh yeah, he uh, uh, off on. Yeah. And I guess like to hear Eric Bischoff's like uh defense, he's like Brett would show up thirty minutes before the show started, look like he was sleeping on a park bench, wondering what he was gonna do tonight. So I don't know. That sucks. Know right. we do I'm a Brett accept- I'm a Brett Hart guy. Oh yeah, yeah. we don't accept uh, Brett Hart slander on this podcast. Instant oh, no. ban. That's uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael Beck, thank you for the $10. Um, thank you, Michael. Renee, I loved seeing you uh, getting a singles push on SmackDown back in 04. I always wanted you to have a run with the US title. A French Canadian as United States champion could have written itself. No shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> I keep saying he could have dropped the title, uh, put in a trash bag, and brought out the European title. It's, no, it's, I could have changed the nameplate, put a French flag there instead of the American US title, right? Yeah. That would have been know, awesome uh, if you had your own title. Yeah. Like a little, like, like baguettes on the side and like a poodle, like all like emblems, like little plates. Oh, you guys want to hear a Michael Hayes story? Paul, this involves you. Paul had oh, gave shit. Me an idea. Paul had gave me an idea that. I should come to the ring with baguettes. You know, that's a <laughs> red, but I would stick a lead pipe in the baguette, right? Yes. Corner over the head with it. And then I actually went up to Michael Hayes with the idea that Paul gave me. He was like, dude, dude, we're not, I think you got, I think you got something there. And it never, <laughs> went, it never went further than that, dude, dude. But, uh, it was probably because they didn't, totally they probably, ball. They probably didn't know what a baguette was. I know. Remember, there was a writer, uh, Dan Madigan. He wrote Sino Evil, uh, Kane's movie, because he's really good right. friends with Kane. Um, and as are most pro choice or pro life people. Uh, anyways, uh, Dan Madigan was a writer. 
and he had told me because he left he was just kind of fed up with it he had presented the idea of eddie guerrero giving big show like bad tamales or burrito a bad burrito or something and that's what kept big show on the toilet because vince loves like toilet humor and he said that vince called him out at a meeting and was like when when he pitched the idea he's like do you want to stand up and tell the room what a what, what a burrito is like he didn't know what a burrito was <laughs> like what the fuck <laughs> and he also like didn't know who Johnny Depp was remember that's why they killed that pirate gimmick apparently with Birchill cuz he wanted him to be like a a serious like blackbeard pirate like a real pirate kind of you know aching back to the Jean-Pierre Lafitte stuff right but he started doing like this Jack Sparrow type shit and he was like, why is he goofy? Like, why is he tripping? And like, this is terrible. And they're like, oh, he's doing like Jack Sparrow, you know, like the Johnny Depp thing. Uh, who the hell is Johnny Depp? He doesn't work here. That, uh, like, yeah. So my guess is they didn't know what a baguette was. It was like, it's probably like, what'd you call me? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it would have been awesome. Bunga Bunga, who is the most fun wrestler on the night out? Paul London. Oh, shut up. No. I can say the same for an A. Go there on. Go. It's each other. We had Next question. Tons of, tons of great times. <laughs> I've got to catch up. Man, these questions are like from an hour ago. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for all you super chatters. All right. Here we go. Uh, Fick the gas. See it. Oh, snap. Hey, Paul. Right I'll be in. LA next week. How can I get a hold of Mr. California? And do you still do naked yoga? Hashtag easy like Sunday morning. Okay. Victor's awesome. He's one of he's one of the first people I trained back in the day. Uh, and rumor has it, Mr. California is waiting for you, Victor. If anyone wants to have a a laugh. Get on YouTube and look up some Mr. California promos and hardcore matches. That's all I'm going to say. In terms of naked yoga, I mean, you don't want to let clothes get in the way, right? They might limit your flexibility. Now, I've actually never done yoga in my life, believe it or not. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I probably should. But never have. Victor's great. I miss Victor. Uh, Renee's not here, so we'll answer it for him. How did Renee's off full ECW vignettes come about? Which vignettes? I'm trying to remember. It's like he was standing like a mirror, I think. And he was like the most extreme athlete in ECW. Looking in the mirror? Some of that. Renee, where are you? We're talking shit about you. So God, he's probably getting more coffee. Yeah. Well, we'll ask thank, him. We'll, thank you, we'll, Supernaut, for the donation. Did you guys Renee, talk about me? Yeah, they asked you a question. They asked, what, what, and I'm, it was like, how did your awful ECW vignettes come about? And I'm not making, I'm not saying. Shit. That was Vince what, McMahon's idea. And it sucked. What vignettes? I don't remember. Oh, it was horrible, Paul. They had me Something about a mirror. mirror. Like yeah, what was. Calling myself extreme, my little <laughs> white panties. <laughs> then I, then I did, the I white panties white automatically panties. doesn't make it awful. Come on, man, with your tan. No, they had me doing like this exercise bike, but this exercise bike was from 1974, and I'm doing this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> had you been sprayed horrible. down beforehand, or did you like oil up? Of course, I oiled up. And then they had me coming out of the shower and staring at my dick and like Renee had the best tan <laughs> ever. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. And I'll, he probably doesn't remember this, but I remember he like I want to say in Louisville he had more than one tanning membership at a time at different tanning salons, which yeah. is like illegal or against some sort of health violation or something. I don't know, I don't know how I don't have like. 
10 different types of fucking skin cancers. Right yeah, because I remember he was like, I think he tanned like twice or three times in a day or something at one three point. Times, and I was like, I turned, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was, and yeah. I was like, dude, like that's like you shouldn't like I was I was bothered tanning once every 24 hours. And I did that a few times. But I was like, dude, that's really bad. Like you probably shouldn't like you could die. And his response was like, well, at least when I die, I'll be tan. <laughs> I was like his coffin is gonna have lights in it, like the tanning lights in it. His coffin is gonna look like a tanning bed. <laughs> I I brought that super chat up at the wrong time. Thoughts on Fister passing away. <laughs> Fuck, that was so brutal, man. That was so brutal. Okay, sorry guys. You know me; I gotta eat every three hours. And we, no, we eat, for, eat, yeah. coffee, piss, tan. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna grab a tan real quick. I'll be back in about twenty minutes. Yeah, he pulls out the little face gimmick, <laughs> like that plugs in on the desk. Yeah, this was uh, one of my favorite people backstage because, for all he had done and had been there for as long as he had i mean we're like going back to like men on a mission um never had an ego never big dogged anybody was always super chill super cool with just like i mean if you're not a cool dude or a cool person like he wasn't gonna waste time with you but just never had a big head or an ego or anything it was one of the coolest dudes uh i'd ever <laughs> gotten to hang out with and i remember there was a time in um i want to say it was in new zealand i had met this guy on the plane ride to auckland i think we were in australia and then we flew down to new zealand for literally one day for a show and then flew back to australia to finish this tour on the way to New Zealand, I had met this, like, the plane was packed. And I, hadn't, and I was the only, I was in the only row that had an empty seat between me and this other passenger. And right as I closed in the doors, this big, like, hand comes in and opens the door. I was like, oh, shit. Like, this guy's, and it was this big, uh, he might have been Ma Maori. Um, did I pronounce that correctly? Um, and he came down the aisle and sure enough, he sat right in between and it was just like, Oh fuck. I was like in the aisle, but like kind of in the actual aisle. Anyways, we got to talking and he was like this big security guard guy for all the local shows and stuff that would come to the building. And this was during my heavy, heavy smoking days. Long story short, Brian and I go out there. We have this match. We tried to do like this bushwhacker spot. It fell flat. It was garbage. Um, we get back. It was like freezing rain outside too. We get to the back. One of the agents comes to me and they're like, uh, someone, look, you have a friend here. Like somebody knows you. And I was like, what? And it was this guy that I had met. He called himself big sir. And he, uh, showed up and he had this backpack and he pulled out a program and he was like, yo man, I got you, bro. I got you. I was like, what? He opened up this backpack Imagine corn on the cob wrapped in tinfoil. Now imagine 25 stalks of corn on the cob wrapped in tinfoil. This backpack was stuffed, right? But it was the most insane looking weed I had ever seen in my life. Like stuff off of the cover of High Times. Like it was insane. Crystallized, like translucent. <laughs> and he was like, this is all for you. Can you just give me a few signatures? I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know? And went around to like my homies that I knew, you know, burned. And uh, Visser is one of the first people I invited up to the hotel to come smoke with us. And um, I let him have the bed. And he just, man, he was... He was a great, great guy. He was so fun to be around. And he was just, like I said, always so chill. And needless to say, I believe that weed was laced with PCP. 
which is something that apparently happens quite often in New Zealand. <laughs> Because I remember not being able to go to sleep. It was like we were supposed to be on the bus in like four hours. And I knew that if I fell asleep, it was like I was going to get fired because I was not going to wake up. Because I would close my eyes and it was just like a fireworks show with my eyes closed. And that's so I ended up packing up all my shit and going down and sleeping on the bus. And funny enough, Brian had done the same thing because he was having the same reaction. <laughs> and so, uh, but then we kind of got out of all that because JBL of all people was late that morning to get on the bus for the tour. So it kind of took, a, you know, all the attention off, but this was just, uh, the nicest guy. And that's why I mentioned a while back during that rumble entrance, I wanted to do some stuff with him in my short amount of time in that rumble, because I was just thinking like, how are people not, putting him over he's the biggest guy in the match and you know like that's that's as david and goliath as a god for me i mean but um was really just guys and you know they pass away and it's you know, you know it's always sad of course but that was one that was um just just very, very heartbreaking because you start thinking back to like the last time you saw him and um, I never encountered him in a bad mood no. and you know yeah and he was starting to get into acting and stuff like that he was in he's I think one of the better parts of this movie called Wrong Side of Town that Van Damme is supposed to be the headliner of he's the, definitely the main character but the director loved Batista. So Batista is actually like front and center on the cover and like Van Damme is off to the side and like Ja Rule's off to the other side. Uh, but there's a scene with this and it's, uh, he was, he was good. He was a good actor. I thought like he was it's definitely one of the better scenes in this movie. Um, but yeah, nope. he was awesome. All right, we'll uh, try and catch on some super chats. Uh, SoCal Chris, thank you. Uh, did Hoovy really think he was on par with The Rock? Yes. <laughs> really? First three times I met him, he like never took his sunglasses off. And and that irritated me so bad. I had worked Hoovy before WWE on the independents. And he was cool. Like we got along, and everything was cool. And like I don't know what it was, but man, the Mexicals, like the whole thing, just it. It was like for knowing how the office felt about the cruiserweight division, how they just didn't give a fuck about us. To then having the Mexicals come in and like clean house with a bunch of us, like it was, it was tough at first because you just kind of like. You know, I don't know. Vince was like really high on them at first, but I think that waned uh, rather quickly. Um, I mean, I always got along with all those guys, but I just remember the first few times that I would work with Hoovy, he never took his sunglasses off, and that always pissed me off. Like that always rubbed me wrong. So it was like, dude, we're indoors. Like, take your fucking sunglasses off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. The fuck? The juice, baby. The juice. Kiss me, Randy. Kiss, kiss me. <laughs> Just one kiss, Randy. Come on. One kiss. <laughs> Hoovy, get the fuck out of here now. <laughs> Come on, Randy. Just kiss me. One kiss, please. <laughs> 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 I've said too much. And I love it when people say this podcast, oh, they're just bitter. <laughs> oh, we're just putting ourselves laughing over stories. God. <laughs> it's it, they're uh, the better way, ones. I don't know. Uh, by the way, I should have said this a few times, everyone, but please, if you're new to the channel, thank you for joining. Please hit that subscribe button. Uh, I know we're three hours in, but I should have said that about two hours ago, but never mind. <laughs> I'm only two hours in. I'm trying to hit the oh, like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, me and Renee proper troopers tonight. Uh, yeah, you guys. 
burning the candle at both ends. <laughs> Ezekiel, you there? Any test stories, opinions on him in the ring? When I first met him, he was an absolute dickhead. And then <laughs> post WWE, uh, we guys should be game cool. In the ring, in WWE, he was fucking stiff as shit. Every time he touched me, it hurt me. Then post WWE, <laughs> uh, I gave it back to him in France and I stiffed the shit out of him. No shit, really? Oh, yeah. Did yeah. he say anything after? Or? What the fuck is he going to say? <laughs> hey, you hit me with that fucking baguette, hey, man. Jobber. Take it Yo, easy. Yeah, that was his big deal. Hey, yeah. No, but I, was on, I, I, yeah. I think in, uh, when you're in the WWF and then with that, com- there's a competition factor, right? And then when you're out of there, some guys maybe get closer, some guys don't. But I became closer with him, but I was never his friend. I mean, we're both Canadians, but. You know, we're never boys, but in the yeah. ring, because we were we were put together right when we got there. That was our first big uh, angle or big uh, feud. Yeah, and T- Tess would beat the fuck out of us. Was it him and uh, Stauber? Yeah. Oh, him and Steiner. Yeah. That's Steiner, okay. Steiner, yeah. Fuck. Right. Uh, Plandemic four twenty. Thank you for the super sticker. Plandemic. <laughs> What's a super sticker? What's the difference between super sticker and super chat? I don't know. Oh. Goes right here. I just don't know. Um, let's see. Let me try and find some more here. Um, I think we're actually catching up. Uh, here we go. Uh, big boy. Uh, what do you guys think of Chris Canyon? Has Renee or London? And we've talked about Chris Canyon a lot tonight, but. Um, Paul, you wasn't here when we spoke about him. You got any stories on Chris Canyon? We're talking about the wrestler Chris Canyon, right? Yes. Yeah. Like, because isn't there wasn't there like some office guy named like? No, that was Canyon Seaman. Oh Jesus! Chris Canyon was awesome. Easily uh, one of my favorite people. Loved working with him. Always so friendly. Another guy who sadly had he felt comfortable being himself and who he truly was, um, I felt could have been a true, absolute trailblazer in professional wrestling, which would have busted the door open for all other talents that felt trapped within themselves. Um, Absolutely devastated when he passed away um, because I mean, he was, uh, he was one of my favorite people before I even, when I had, I mean, there was like club Canyon, I think is what they called his, his house in Atlanta or something. Cause he, he housed a lot of guys. He let like a lot of guys like stay at his place and was just always, um, just very warm, like to, uh, especially a lot of the younger guys and very helpful. Um, and just one of the kindest, uh, most generous guys I have ever worked with and ever got to work with and had a pleasure working with them. Um, you'll like this thing, Renee, somewhere out there, there's a dark, or a, uh, a tryout match or a local match, a job match, whatever you want to call it, that Canyon showed me one time where (laughs) we were having a laugh and he was working Sparky Plug. Like, literally, I want to say it was the character Sparky Plug. And Canyon, he was, like, just a local job guy. And he goes, yeah, I don't know, like, what got into me, but, they're like, Bob called some spot for me to, like, get up on him real quick. So like, I remember knocking him down and then like, I don't know what got into me, but I just looked at the camera and I went and buckled in and started driving. So he was like totally mocking him. And he goes, yeah. And then like Bob got up and just beat the shit out of me. <laughs> right. But he showed me the match and it was hilarious. Uh, but he was just, yeah, he, uh, he was 
super innovative too, especially for like his size. I mean, this guy was like six, five, six, six. Um, I thought the Mortis stuff was amazing. Like I loved that whole gimmick when I would, when I would see it. Uh, I loved Canyon. I thought he was, um, just a great guy. Absolutely. Great guy. And he was another one that would say like, why are you here? Like, you're too nice. Like you're too good for this place. Like you're too nice. Like why are you here? It's like, oh, I don't get it. Right. Thank you for the three dollar donation. Oh yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Alice is cute. Yeah. Yep. I think we're actually. Thank you. Caught we're caught up. We're caught up. We're okay. all caught up. We're all caught up. So that well, means I can go pack my bag. <laughs> nope. Um, <laughs> you need another cup of coffee. Okay. What time is it where you're at, Paul? It's like... It's uh, 2 a.m. No, it's not. It's like 4.30 in the afternoon, right? I don't know. I don't go by Earth time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's ten thirty. What time is it there, man? Is it like three in the morning? Uh, two twenty-seven. Holy oh, shit! Speaking of uh, that, ain't nothing. Log, huh? uh, we've got some more super chats coming in. But speaking of Earth, what's your thoughts on people that believes the Earth is flat? I challenge them to just keep running, and <laughs> they'll fall off the edge one of these days. Just keep running. I generally believe society got to a peak in like intelligence, and now it's a slippery slope down. Off the edge of the earth? Probably. Well, in their heads, yeah. <sighs> this is going to get deep if we go down this path. <laughs> it's going to get too deep. No, no. You know what happens when we start bringing up conspiracy theories? We get in trouble. Let's try to protect ourselves. Uh, well, it's not The Earth is fucking round. <laughs> okay. There's, there's Imagine a globe, like in the, in the in yeah, in the history in the, in the geography classroom. Imagine a globe that's flat. Like you wouldn't be able to. I guess you'd have to spin it. You know, like it would be. Well, this way, I mean, the, the instead way of a globe, that you spin around. The way I look at it, the sun's a globe, the moon's a globe, Jupiter's a globe, Mars is a globe, Venus is a globe. Get take the fucking hint. <laughs> the Earth is a globe. Okay, there's evidence out there. Try it. Fucking honestly. Um, bunga bunga. 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 Have Thank you, you. Ever have any issues with locker room thieves? I know one. <laughs> oh well, that wasn't in the locker room. Oh, no, no, there's one uh, a, NASC, a stock car oh, racer. Who oh, be... oh, you mean uh, the stock car racer? Yes. Yeah. That was more like vandalism. But plug Holly. I um, thought still watch. James keeps freezing. Am I? Yeah. Okay, you're good now. Well, I heard he uh, stole a watch. Oh, the Rolex? So, yeah. Yeah. All I know, because I wasn't there, I was gone by this point. What I had heard <clears throat> was that a Rolex had got stolen and somebody's visa or passport had gotten stolen. Oh, uh, Justin Roberts. <clears throat> oh, that's when they took his visa to rib him so he couldn't get home. He had to. Well, he, yeah, about... he was like, oh, you're talking about a different time. We're talking about Thurman Sparky, where. That's why he got shit canned, right? Because he was during WrestleMania time and someone's Rolex watch went miss missing. I didn't know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew this was in 2010. Were you gone by 2010 or you were still there? Yeah. You were you were gone? I was a dealer's partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was actually Lance Cade. Lance Cade had told me this before he passed away, right? Fuck. But, yeah. And then Eki Umaga, he took his... Uh, he took the guy's bag 
Sparky and then wrapped it up with a letter saying, we don't want you here or get the fuck out of here or. Yeah. No shit. Yeah. Wow. But then when I was in England, there was a wrestler called, uh, fuck, I forget his name. Anyway, he was, he was a known locker room thief. <clears throat> and I can't prove it, but like. Repo man? Uh, no, he, he kind of looks like, uh, he's a big fat tub of shit anyway. He's a no locker room. Thief, and then I had 20 pounds taken from my, from my payoff. I Fuck. Paid, and then 20 pounds was gone. Right. But I had Sounds like a promoter. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Sounds was, like a promoter. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to call out the person, but yeah, no, they're dead now. Yeah. <clears throat> they're no longer in the business. They got outed. So, right. So, um, Alice said thank you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome, Alice. But right. I think we've got more. <laughs> <to reply. laughs> right. Uh, Josh Coffee, thank you again. One of my favorite weekly post- podcasts. Uh, night, guys. Good night, Josh. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Good night. I fucking wish I could go to bed too. <laughs> nope. More oh, coffee. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right. I'm going to have trouble pronouncing the surname. Is it French? Um, Michael Frusante. <coughs> That's Michael Frusante. Frusante. <laughs> That's Frusante. Italian. He's related uh, to the Chili Peppers guitarist. Oh, right. sorry. Go ahead. I only know Flea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you guys uh, think you would have had a better career slash storylines if it was uh, another writer, if it was Vince Russo writing for you? Kurt Angle always praised his writing. Uh, sure. I don't know. Anyone would have been better than who was writing for me. <laughs> I, I'll i always defend Russo. Like, Russo's had plenty of bad ideas. Well, he's had some brilliant ideas. But Russo always made sure everyone had a spot on the card, and he always wrote for everyone. And I will give him credit for that. Yeah, that's commendable. I mean, how... It, is it that hard? I guess it is if you have 150 people on your show, like some company. Uh, but yeah, is it that hard? Again, if you're put on a pro, if you're put on a television show consistently, whether it's internet show or whatever, then that consistency should involve either a gimmick character and or a storyline. Ideally, both. It shouldn't be that hard. Again, you never hear about writers getting let go because they just didn't have anything. They couldn't come up with anything. So, like, we fired them. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but that would balance the scales a little bit, wouldn't it? Instead hey, of just James, like. Quickly, you you said we started off, we had 200 some viewers. Uh, yeah, about that. Because we got over 400 now. <laughs> Thank Ratings. you so much for everyone staying with us through this. This is great. Thank you so much. Right. Merci beaucoup. I'm, lo- I'm just going to look at the thumbnails. Jade, hi, Jade. You're cute. What thumbnails? <laughs> Can't you see the comment section where there's... No. Uh, I see Monster that. Matt's back. Renee awesome. looking melted by the Flat Earth chat. <laughs> <laughs> It's all that tanning, too. <laughs> okay, guys, look, I got to go back to the, t- the bathroom, okay? So just bear with me. Is that where the tanning bed is? Yes, it's in my toilet, for fuck's sake. <laughs> it's tanning your... That's called a bleached... Never mind. Alice is getting a lot of praise, by the way. Alice is hot. Alice, okay. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Alice is cute. You got a lot of admirers, Alice. <laughs> so uh me me james is a mark i am, <laughs> I am, a, I am a we're mark. all we're all, all marks mark. in one way or another <laughs> the <an> insult <laughs> i would love to see something on a program that makes me believe it oh yes like you know what i mean like i would love to to mark out for something um Last time Wrestling I genu- related. Last time I genuinely marked out 
was when Edge returned at the Rumble. Okay, cool. Because um, I don't know if there was rumours he was coming back, but it was just unexpected. And when he came back, I was like, and obviously over here in the UK, we stay up to like 3 a.m. watching the WWE pay per views. And when he, the music hit, I was like, fucking it. And I was like, no, no. When he came out, I was like, fucking yes. So that was the last time I like really marked out for wrestling. Besides that, it's just so predictable and you just don't believe it. I mean, I can turn on the Bret Hart match and I can believe it and get infested in it, but I just can't get like it with today's wrestling. Right. Bret believed what he was doing, you know, every time. Even if you knew the sequence that his match would typically go in, um, he believed it. He believed it enough to, to draw you in. And it was an easy ride to take because it's, you know, it's just it's an absolute craftsman. So I think, I think the live stream is starting to become a dating site. So, um, Jesus <laughs> everyone, Christ, everyone complimenting each other. So, um, let's see. All right, here's Jade. You just got called a Mark. So, I mean, well, Jade, it's cute, Renee. You are right. Yeah. Oh, that. Oh, yeah. That's the girl's talking about. Hey, you, hey, Jade. Hey. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I'm going back outside, boys. Oh, fuck. Hey, then. Hey, Renee. Am I cute? Uh, no, not at all. That's fucked up. <laughs> I think it was the child in the picture saying, asking that. Don't oh, you know, Renee's fucking hilarious. <laughs> it's from Lit, some Stone Papa Smurf. <laughs> That's hilarious. Great name. <laughs> Stone Papa Smurf. That's my <laughs> favorite little icon so far. That was good. <laughs> Jade Fiala is still cage match. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> oh my oh, god. I, I love our audience. Um RT Machine, you've been absolutely great tonight. Uh what was Thank the best you, RT Machine. What was the best wrestling TV show? Uh does that mean a proper wrestling show or did you ever watch that? Paul? I, I'm guessing you might I don't know if you ever thought about auditioning for it when it was on uh, Glow. Did you ever catch that? Globe, uh, glow, 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 gorgeous ladies of wrestling. Didn't oh you? God, I have yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I had no. I had befriended a guy who bought the rights to the original Globe, or he had come on board as some sort of executive producer or something. Whole thing ended up being a clusterfuck. He tried to like write. He tried to run a Glow show. And it was a disaster and uh, blah, 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 blah. Fast forward a couple of years and I'm supposed to go to um, Peru, I believe. Uh, like tickets bought. I'm booked. This is for like a few shows, a seminar and all this stuff. Um, Chavo Guerrero. And this is around uh, Lucha Underground times. Chavo buzzes me, and he's like, "Hey, uh, do you want to do this this glow this glow spot?" And I, like a fucking idiot, thought he was talking about the company, right? But he was talking about the TV show. Yes. And I was like, oh, you know, like I've already got this booking and I need to, I want to follow through with it and all that stuff. Thank you. But hopefully I can get another one. And like, it didn't come back around. So I was kicking myself afterwards when I realized that it was not for like the actual wrestling company, yeah. but that it was for the TV show. So I didn't, I uh, didn't see any of the episodes. I know that I think, I know Johnny ended up on a few of those episodes. I know Carlito ended up, I think, on a few of those episodes. So, like, yeah, it was a, few, it was a great show. Uh, got cancelled after season three. I think the pandemic affected the um, budget and whatever, but it was a really good show. I really enjoyed it. It became the slam demic. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I've now been on here too long. 
<laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go another. I don't know. We'll go another fifteen or something. Uh, Simon Phoenix, Demolition Man, my one of my favorite movies. Uh, yeah. Dilo Brown, Paul and Renee. I never really got to know him. Only oh, met him a few times. Paul. Yeah, I was like Dilo. I always go along with him. Very, very cool dude. I uh, worked with him as a producer a few times at Impact. Um, yeah, always a very friendly guy. I always go along with him. Good dude. Very good dude. Just uh, catch it up. Uh, Dylan Is that G. Cup 16, Renee? Cup 16 of coffee? You want to get high? I haven't, <laughs> I haven't had one cup of coffee today. I had one this morning. Thoughts on Tyson Kidd's career and as a wrestler, Dylan G. Thank you for the donation. Uh, I just knew Tyson just briefly, just like we kind of came in, like I was on the way out as he was on the way in and always loved chatting with him and with Natty. Um, so was sad to, you know, or up, it's unfortunate to have seen him get injured in such a way that curtailed his in-ring career but i always thought he was an exceptional talent and if i'm not mistaken i think he's part of the office now i know he's definitely was has been a producer for a while and he's uh now part of the office in a bigger role so good for him man Uh, absolutely yeah i've known tj since i was 17 when i no shit yeah when teddy hart Called me to go do the Matt Rats gig in Calgary. Oh wow, he did really. Yeah, uh, where I they is that with the ring. the platforms above the ring post yeah. kind of thing? I actually did a leg drop off the top of that fucking thing onto Harry Smith. So, <laughs> he uh, actually did the shows. Wow, uh, uh, and they had those uh, platform gimmicks. Yeah, I I climbed up on the platform and did a leg drop. <laughs> But oh Jesus Christ! Look at all the super chats we're getting. Fuck! I want to go to bed. They love us. Uh, well, we love you too. I'm just here. Um, Matthew Sheffield, thank you for the seven dollars. Um, Paul and Renee, thoughts on CM Punk and AEW? How was he in the locker room? He's a see you next Tuesday. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you next Tuesday. Uh, not a fan. Not a fan of political guys. Ditto. Or hair pullers. <laughs> Last not by you three will be the number one wrestling podcast. GG. Thank you, Lars. What's the GG part? Um, not good night. Good go, grief. Go Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> What's in that, that coffee? I want some. I tried to interview Jason David and I couldn't get him. You tried to interview who? A Power Ranger? I tried, I tried to get Jason David Frank, you know, uh, Tommy. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't get him. I tried. I hung out with one of the red one of the red Power Rangers at that Wrexham Comic Con because all the wrestlers took off that night. It went wherever they left to. I was the only one that stayed there, like in the dorms at this college and got smashed with one of the red Power Rangers. I can't remember. I think it was like the third one. Third Ranger, that was the red one. I don't remember. Anyways. <laughs> bunga, yeah, bunga. That. The Fiagra Super Chat keeping Renee and James up. <laughs> we need yeah, to get Blue some. Chew, by the way. Send some. <laughs> get us hooked up with Blue Chew. I want that as a sponsor. Uh, ben Hinbash, thank you again. I was a fan of Johnny the Bull Stamboli in w, the WCW and WWE. But what do you guys think he was missing to go that next level in his career? Learning how to wrestle. <laughs> That's <laughs> fucked up. Oh, I worked with Johnny. I worked with Johnny quite a bit at Lucha Libre USA, and he was doing kind of like a a gimmick, like he had done at TNA with like a mask or something. Relic. And yeah, relic. It was like I think it was pretty much a rip off of that. And uh, we had a great time. I mean, I I enjoyed hanging out with him and working with him. We were on like, I think we were both heel. We were both in the same faction. Uh, I always enjoyed being around Johnny um, and working with him, but 
the thing that I always remember about Johnny was that springboard leg drop he did to Terry Funk in WCW where he tore his urethra. Wow. Like, yeah, he told like, I, cause I always thought he like cracked his pelvis or, or his, like some, or his coccyx or something. But yeah, he said, if you find this, yeah, it's Terry Funk and Johnny the Bull and then WCW and Terry's on the outside on the floor on the mats and Johnny put a chair over his face and he does like the running no hands jump up to the top rope. I think he fell back down, like lost his balance, fell back down to the ring and then jump, jumped up and then hopped off the top rope to the floor doing a leg drop on Terry Funk who had a chair over his face and Johnny tore his urethra. So when he gets up to get back in the ring or to pick Terry up, he gets up and just kind of falls right back. Like his legs buckle and he can't stand up. And they ended up just calling the match. But if you go back and watch that spot, it's horrific. Horrific. But yeah, he tore his urethra. I didn't even know that was fucking possible. Wow. Jeez. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. I, know. I, I was just, just fucking around. I'm tired. No, I always like Johnny as a person. <laughs> no, he's saying. <laughs> no. no, no, I'm not going to bet now. Uh, he no, tanned really uh, good yeah no yeah hell of an athlete i remember him telling me a story or was it him or charlie <clears throat> where he had a dark match against raven and raven at that point in time wasn't too fond of working dark matches or working with the younger guys right so what he would do raven was he had the guy in the corner and go to shoot him out but as he would shoot him out he'd put like his left foot out so the guy would trip over his own you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So you're, like, you're going to shoot the guy, but he puts his left leg out so that when the guy's running, he'll trip. Just oh, to make, shit. Purposely make the guys look bad. You know what I mean? Younger Fuck. guys. Yeah. <laughs> God. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. I think we have about 10 more Super Chats come in since we've been talking about the Johnny the Bull. Jesus Christ. Michael Beck, can Alex and Jade be our next guests? Yes. That's a great idea, Michael. Let them endure the four hours. <laughs> uh, Tom Michaels, thank you for the five dollars. Um, Paul and Renee, any memories of Scott Hall? Ever get the chance to meet him? Never met him. Met him one time, SmackDown. I was coming in. Uh, I want to say it was during the uh, fan who got hit by Ric Flair thing that I did in San Antonio. Uh, met him before the show. Super nice guy. Um, was just really friendly, and I was really kind of taken aback by that because I was just like this local guy coming in. But I remember him and Kurt Hennig, and Hennig was my favorite. You know, I was the biggest Mr. Perfect Mark there was. So, yeah. But that was the only time I got to meet him. Yeah. Um, Rob Magwood, thank you for the $10. Um why French tickler like the France Prance was right there, favorite taunt of all time. <laughs> France Prance, that's good. <laughs> yeah, it is. No, that was Jerry Lawler. Jerry, I went to Jerry Lawler one time. And I, said, uh, I need a name for this thing. He's like, uh, Jerry Lawler, <laughs> I was about to say Lawler came up with that. That does not surprise me. Yeah, that was a Lawler thing, dude. He came up with the French tickler name. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I have to highlight this for an AP Super Chat 60 mile man match. God, he'll I'm tap. Gonna tap out, I'm going to tap on it. To, yeah, I'm about to tap. I'm already sick of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Michael POS Taze. POS Bad Street Atlanta today. What was that? Bad Wait, street, what, was, what was the USA. what about the video he made where he's like drinking at the cemetery or something? Oh, that was for uh, that was for, for um, Freebirds, right? Buddy and uh, Buddy Roberts, yeah, right, yeah. Great video. And he looked for an old Freebird like me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. Man, these super chats keeps coming. 
Uh, Renee fair super chats last man standing. Oh, for fuck's sakes, guys. Fucking, he's gonna forfeit this shit. I'm telling you. <laughs> throw in the towel. Oh. I'm gonna throw in the towel. Like right, Kurt Sloan. Well, thank you for the five dollars. Uh, shout out to you guys. Paul was my favorite cruiserweight at the time. Great seeing you guys. Prospered post WWE. Great show, guys. Well, fuck. Prospered you... is generous. Thank you. <laughs> You'd be a super heavyweight in AEW, Paul. Yeah, God. Probably. Thank you. Very nice of you to say. Appreciate it. (laughs) Uh, Another one. Uh, (laughs) Tommy Dreamer, Swollen Testicle. (laughs) (laughs) These names are getting better and better. Now these names are just gonna be fucked. Like this is gonna get more and more fucked names. Do you remember the U shoots you used to get like horse cock express and like Shawn Michaels lazy eye? We're getting that territory and it's off the <laughs> Read the question. I'm trying to understand it. Hey fellas of the ladies in the locker room, would one be the queen of flatulence? Flatulence. Farting, I believe. Farting, yeah. Right? Didn't they give Natalia the gimmick where she was farting all the time? I remember vaguely that? remember that. Yes, yes, I remember that. I'll tell you a story about flatulence and divas. Tori Wilson. <clears throat> We're on a flight to Australia. I'm sitting next to Tori Wilson. She passes out. And I... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she let one lose during her sleep. Oh, and I, I, I actually thought it was cute. I didn't even, I wasn't even gross. <laughs> <laughs> was this before or after she was a guest on the Renee Cafe, Cafe de Renee? Uh, I think it was afterwards. Didn't matter though. <laughs> I still would have hit it. Jeez. Renee was in the seat after she left. Fucking right, I was. You know, I was. <laughs> in all this, Peter, you need a coffee sponsorship. That's a good I idea. Yeah, I need a lot of things. Enormous, Peter. Enormous, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> These fucking names. <laughs> We should, do a con- we should do a contest. Who has the best screen name, dude? We really should. You right. guys are. Oh, we're caught up. Tre- Tremendous. Caught up? Okay, let's fucking let's let's shut this shit down before they. Fucking- <laughs> let's throw the towel in. Oh uh, yeah, I gotta get scooting. In all in seriousness, I appreciate all of you. Thank you for your super chats. Thank you for hanging in here and having fun with me, myself, Paul. And even though Paul was an hour and a half late, that's okay. Uh, made it. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for all your donations and for your fun questions and your even more fun screen names. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, uh, same bad time, same bad channel next Thursday, Paul. Okay. That's right. I'll try okay. to be on time. Okay, and I'll make sure to let you know who our special guest is. That way, there you're not an hour and a half late, okay? <laughs> Yeah, that way I can like you know do some research, prepare some questions, uh, or just become two hours late. <laughs> please, please don't, because next Friday I got to fly out to Toronto. I got a five o'clock, five a.m. flight. So oh fuck me! I know oh, Miami, Miami Bo. No thank question. you, just, uh, thank you, Miami Bo, for the nine. thank you, thank you. Okay, hey, Miami Bo. Huh? He's a UK guy. Thank you for staying up so late. Yeah, man. Yeah, That's- see? Yeah. You're yeah. you're a true, true uh, influence there, James. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And uh, coming this Monday, uh, Dawn Rick, great interview. And coming this Tuesday from my archives, uh, my interview with Jeff Jarrett. I think you should enjoy that one. Oh, cool. Oh, sweet. Always like Jeff. Oh, he's yeah. a great guy. So uh, I'll pull out Tuesday. So yeah. So J E double F G E R double E R. What is it? J A double R E double T. I always liked that. That did you ask him about the Aztec 
singlet thing that he wore, like oh, that yeah, teal like and thing. orange. Ah, that was my favorite outfit. Yeah. Fuck. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. And if you're in the Maritimes, I will be tomorrow night in Bridgewater, Saturday night in Digby, and Sunday night in Shelburne, Nova Scotia. So come out and uh, hang out and watch me do what I do all night. And if you're in hell, come to the gimmick table. I'll be there. <laughs> and if you want to follow any of us on social media, we might as well plug everything. <laughs> Well, I don't post it. anything. I don't post anything. So if you follow me on social media, Prepare you're not going to see it, shit. Right? Yeah. Well, uh, cafe, at Cafe Day Renee on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter. And we post updates on when episodes are coming out so you don't miss us. And uh, yeah, if you said if you want to tweet us, just. Yeah. And at 25,000 subs, me, Paul, and James will be doing drinks with Dupree. We're going to get fucking smashed on air live. 25,000 subs, right, Paul? That's pretty, I, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I haven't drank in quite a while, but uh, I'm willing to fall off the wagon just for you. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> I can hold it down with Dupree and James. That's right. We'll be doing karaoke with Renee and Paul and James. God. Yeah. We'll you know, the last one of I randomly real quick, I went to Japan. I can't remember. This is not the last time I went, but one of the last times I went and ended up, we ended up going to a birthday party for Loki. And we were at this Yakiniku place in Rapungi. And we started doing karaoke and lo and behold, one of the options on the karaoke was a Steven Seagal song. So you're damn right I sang that song because I used to <laughs> I used to have the Steven Seagal album Songs from the Crystal Cave. And if oh. you didn't know that exists, look it up because it's ridiculous. And it's BB King endorsed it. Wow. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> Songs from the Crystal Ca Crystal Cave, Steven Seagal. So if any of you do karaoke and you ever see a Steven Seagal song, please do it. It's a real hit. Real good way to get over real fast. Real fast. And ask okay. to leave the Yakiniku place. All right. With that being said, uh, bonsoir and Paul James, we'll see you on Thursday. Okay. Buenas noches. Buenas nachos. Bonsoir. See y'all later. Bonner soir, whatever he said. <laughs>